To be back. I had uh, the flugi last week, but I'm here again. Yeah, the floopy movies. feel bads. <laughs> mm -hmm. The floopy feel bads. We'll go with that. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you're back, man. We missed you. We just I missed you all too. Without you. So, no, glad to have you back in 100% again. So, welcome everybody to open bar number 85. We are climbing mm. up the rankings slowly but surely. Can you believe we've been doing this for 85 years? Nearing that 100. Got to do something special. Yeah, got to get some strippers in for that. Guaranteed. Ooh. I'm not mm. against this plan. Good one. <laughs> I'll send some to your house. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, wow, welcome everybody, and uh, we've got a lot to talk about tonight, so I think it's about time we start bringing our guests in so we can get started. Yes. Uh, first up, he is a man who has a story for every occasion. He is the one and only Mr. Robert Meyer Burnett. Welcome back, my friends. Hello there, it's good to see you, and thanks for uh, letting me uh, use your commentary on Russell Brand's show at the opening of my show, and you didn't strike me with any copyrights or anything. And also, <laughs> congratulations on the dropping of the trailer for your film. Oh, yeah. thanks, man. Yeah. Very so exciting. Uh, looks great. Can't wait to see it. Well done. Thank you. We did a thing. And, you know, we're starting to show the world it. So it's all good. It was good fun. And uh, hopefully people enjoy the movie when it comes out. And it's just going to come out on my channel. Like, people keep asking me, you know, where's it going to be released? What platform will it be on? Uh, yeah, right here on YouTube. So everyone can see it if they want to anyway. I keep Watch comparing it. you to Godard and Truffaut and how they were critics that wrote for Cahiers du Cinema and then they transitioned over to filmmakers themselves and changed the world. I figure I expect great things from you to do the same thing. <laughs> oh, no sure, problem. No, no problem. problem, yeah. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Is this where I have to constantly say to people now, I'm a filmmaker now, so I understand <laughs> how difficult it is to make Yes, movies. yes, it is. <laughs> it's a lie. It's really easy. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god <laughs> the truth comes out no nah, yeah well i can't take credit for any of it anyway because I, I actually got people who knew what they were doing to make this one so uh yeah that was from my point of view it was very easy i just got to sit back and watch them work so that was nice um anyway we should bring in our next guest uh he is um a series regular here on the open bar in fact i'm beginning to suspect he might have an alcohol problem himself he is the littlest of platoons <laughs> welcome back only suspecting. No, I firmly <laughs> have an alcohol problem. Absolutely, I do. Um, well, we can't I'm, see you for real, so we don't quite know, you know? No, I and this know, wine glass I have is, is always, always full, so maybe I'm just doing it all for show. But no, I, I can confirm I'm definitely a high-functioning alcoholic. Superb. As long as you remain high-functioning, that's all we can ask, really. <laughs> Your so. three voices together are just outstanding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, the, I'm the gratingly annoying one out of the three, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> English, Welsh, and Scottish. Not bad, eh? It's pretty I know, good. We've assembled quite the panel. We've got an American, and we're about to add another American into the mix. He was from California, and now he's coming to us from Texas. He is the one and only nerdiest of nerdrotics. Hey, Hail! Gary, Hail! you're What's back. What's up? I'm back. <laughs> hey, the only thing uh, harder than filmmaking, guys, is streaming. Okay, let's just oh, be real. About that is true, yeah. <laughs> Guys are working like a lot of yeah, hard work going on here. And stuff. They've got no clue about how yes. difficult it is to be a, a multi-millionaire streamer. True. They have no idea what it's like going down to the streaming mines. That's what we do every day. Mm -hmm. yes. Every day. Hey, it's good to be here. Uh, my voice is not as soothing as these guys, but at least I'm sober. So there you go. That is true. You don't want to find us on that one. Us. Yeah. Uh, well, it's great to have you back, Gary. And well, Thanks the bar is assembled. On. It's open. The drinks are poured, whether it's water or whether it's something stronger. I'll leave that up to you. But uh, we are here. And I guess the first thing to talk about is Dune 2. It's upon us now. And I'm pretty sure everyone here has seen it through fair means or foul. And I guess it's a good chance to talk about it. Now, I will say, just before we start, right, um, everyone in the chat or most of the people there probably haven't seen it. So we should try and keep it as spoiler free as we can. I know mm -hmm. we're going to touch on things here and there, but... If we could try and not 
spoil the movie for people because I don't want to do that for people because I do want them to see it and I want them to enjoy it and I don't want to ruin it for them. So I'll, I'll try and speak in generalities if I can. All Which right. It's going to get really difficult because we're all going to get super passionate about it <laughs> one way or the other. Um, but yeah, I guess what was what was your impressions on it? Um, I guess from my own point of view, I rather enjoyed that film. I thought it was excellent to see a smart, um, thoughtful, um, contemplative sci-fi movie again. Uh, we've been really lacking them in recent years, and I think it's a pretty good continuation from the first part of Dune. I'll, I'll turn it over to the panel, really. I'm oh. interested to hear your thoughts. Well, Robert, you need to start that one. That's contemplative. I'm not contemplating, dude. I well, need- look, look I, I mean, this is the third adaptation of this book behind David Lynch and then the Sci-Fi Channel miniseries, and now what Denis Villeneuve has done. And I, I look, I think from a from a filmmaking standpoint and an experiential, I don't know what we call it, a cinematic experience, especially if you see it in IMAX, it is one of the most overwhelming and um, it, it, I think it takes filmmaking to a new level. I, my favorite word, verisimilitude, is reflected very much in this experience because we've never seen a world that is so realistically brought to life so convincingly brought to life i mean you think back to the the david lynch version they couldn't they couldn't make the ornithopters work you know the ornithopters the Hmm. the fighters you know that have literally have flapping wings like a dragonfly they weren't able to do that with visual effects back in 1984 and to see the realism that is brought to um brought to this film is it's staggering and the combination how hans zimmer's score slash atmospherics i mean sitting in an imax theater i've never quite experienced even more so than dune one anything like this by the end of this movie my jaw was hanging on the ground that said i do feel that there's a distance between the audience and their emotions Mm -hmm. and what you see on the screen and look i think it's one of the great cinematic experiences you could possibly have but and I heard Mahler saying a little bit uh, to this in the beginning that it might be a little emotionally distancing for people. It's it's a it's a great intellectual exercise, but I don't know how much of a heart exercise it is, if that makes any sense. That's mm-hmm. what I my takeaway as well. I'm very impressed by the film, but yeah. I'm not in love with the film, and it's I'm going to have to go and spend a lot more time with it because there are large parts of it where I'm wondering how much of it I'm filling in in terms of information on characters and world building stuff because I've read the books and how much of it is actually present in the film because the film's an interesting it's 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 surprisingly minimalist and that's you know the comments that um Denny made about not liking dialogue in the film that that's very much coming to the fore and actually the the extent to which he he managed to to convey so many of the book's ideas without heavy recourse on on uh dialogue and exposition is is quite remarkable and it's really well done um but it does make me wonder how much of the information in the world building stuff I'm, I'm actually filling in and some of the changes that are made again we're not going to do spoilers but like well everyone knows because it's in the trailer fade Rauther, for example is in the film right and there are changes made to his character um which i think cheapen him but because of the way that everything in the book is supposed to be connected from characters to predictions and it's about the folly and the floor of predictive systems of control when you start taking away aspects of individual characters, you tend to find it does a lot of damage to a lot of things besides the character you're taking away from. So if you simplify a character like Fade Rauther, then you're also you're going to have to simplify the Baron, who I think has been simplified, the relationship between the Bene Gesserit and um, Paul Atreides and their plan for the future. So a lot of the, the overarching theme of the book is there but it's very much been abridged and i think it makes for a less engrossing certainly a less lovable version of the story for all it is incredibly impressive and i still really enjoyed it yeah i I agree (laughs) (laughs) uh, yeah i'm not in love with the film either i'm in like with it i'm in like with it it's technically brilliant like 10 out of 10 the effects were amazing. It had a hundred ninety million dollar budget. They spent that wisely. That's still up there, but like it looks like it at least, and it embarrasses everything about Hollywood. Um, yes, yeah. Um, the mega geek, my good friend Ian on Twitter, had the best uh, one word description of it: clinical. I think it's very mm. clinical. It is a clinic. It is how you make a film. It is great. Denis V for Vendetta did a great job. <laughs> um, 
And, uh, you know, I'm hit on miss on him. Like, I like some of his stuff, and I can't stand some of his stuff. Blade Runner 2049 is a total piece of crap. But uh, <laughs> Agreed. Uh, yeah, that's but, fair. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, but I like I really enjoyed it. Like I, I just slightly less than the first one. I can't wait to see it like all at once, and and I've seen it twice, so my mind hasn't changed on that. But you absolutely have to see it. It is a different experience. Like if you're watching it even in a nice home theater, like in a 4DX or an IMAX, it has to be seen yeah. on that. Yeah, uh, and because uh, it's not out over here, so I had to huff some spice and get visions of the future of myself uh, sitting down in IMAX in two days' time when I will actually see it in the IMAX. It makes thing. a difference. I don't think I the spice to... vision has quite such good resolution. No, <laughs> I had to actually travel to America to go watch it. That's amazing. You know, yeah, you did that. That's the lengths I'm willing to go to to get a good experience with this movie. How come they didn't do fan screenings in the UK? That's that's because they're dicks. Lame. They're like, the and like they absolutely screwed us over with this one because normally we're pretty much bang on with uh, the American release and yeah, not not so much. No, but I, I like I enjoyed. I just think it had some pacing issues. I think the ending is a little rushed. You know, these are my gripes, but it's still like an eight out of ten. It's probably going to be the best movie of the year because mm. this year looks like yeah. crap anyway. So definitely go and see it. Uh, but uh, yeah, I we'll, we'll discuss like the problems I have, but I think it's like a, a, a Denis valuetainment problem more than anything else as a director because he's not perfect. No director is. But it's a staggering example. I mean, you know, we, we had two examples, I think, of, of genre filmmaking, fantasy filmmaking this year that uh, one was Godzilla minus one and the other is is this, where you you have directors who really understand how to make films how to use visual effects properly. I think a lot of directors don't anymore. They're not trained. I mean, Denis Villeneuve and, and the director of Godzilla Minus One worked their way up. You know, they had careers. If you look at Polytechnic and Incendies, which is early Villeneuve stuff, and then watch his career, he then transitioned over to making studio filmmaking. He really learned his craft. And part of the, the thing that you see in Hollywood now is these directors that are directing these tentpole properties that especially the later Marvel films don't have that pedigree. And I think you need an experienced director that understands how to utilize VFX, which is something that Denis Villeneuve has learned to do. If you look at arrival, you look at blade runner 2049 and now the two Dune movies, the use of visual effects and the creation of verisimilitude is pretty staggering. And I think he's working at a level that maybe only Christopher Nolan can reach in the sense that Christopher Nolan wants to shoot as much as he can practically, whereas Denis Villeneuve likes to utilize effects, but he treats effects as if they're real in terms of the approach, in terms of the way he's lighting, even in the way he's shooting. You don't see weird, sweeping, virtual camera moves in his, in his work, even when he's utilizing what might only have effect shots in it. He's shooting it as if it's a camera on a location somewhere, shooting something flying by as opposed to being a visual effect and when you see it collectively on the screen it creates a feeling when you're watching something you're absolutely convinced you don't think to yourself oh that's a matte painting or oh that's a that's a cg ornithopter the the the, the idea of creating a reality that you can believe in is staggering in this movie I, I would yeah. agree. Um, I think when I when I did my own review of this, I compared it to the CGI in something like The Flash Ugh. or the Marvel movies, where it's so gratuitous, it's so like visually cluttered and and over the top and just almost nauseating. When you see CGI properly employed in a movie like this by a director who knows where and when to use it, because obviously it's it's a super effects heavy movie, like yeah. the. the the planet, the spaceships, all the combat scenes, the sandworms, everything all has to be rendered in CGI. And it's because it's done with restraint, because it's done with that eye on realism and believability at every turn, you can absolutely get immersed in it. And it never feels overwhelming. It feels like you're witnessing real things happening. It's that effective. And I really appreciate it. That's what CGI can do in the hands of a, a capable very visually oriented director do you know what their secret was so i was uh we were walking around comic-con me and chris gore last year and we ran into somebody who watches our stuff who worked on the movie and uh they're this this is breaking news fans you, you know why the effects weren't that expensive and why they were so good they they planned 
<laughs> they planned they didn't ahead. have to render the same scene like 15 Crazy. times yeah oh they, and they stuck with their plan <laughs> they didn't reshoot everything and and wipe out all their effects and overwork their effects people they just planned and stuck with it previs yeah crazy crazy yep. we used it on rogue, Ele rogue elements even for the, yes. the fight scenes to avoid having to shoot the same thing like 10 times yeah it's amazingly effective it really is somebody should tell marvel someday I well, definitely agree with some of the criticisms, um, particularly in terms of like taking away certain elements from characters, because one of the things I, I really picked up on is the Harkonnens, which were built up as this super um, tactically savvy, manipulative house, uh, particularly the Baron, um, suddenly become kind of dumb in this movie and just they let things slide. They don't deal with growing threats when they really should and they they just kind of sit back and let themselves get attacked and it did strike me as a little bit of wow these guys just seem like pushovers because the plot calls for them to lose and i i would have liked to have seen a bit more strategizing on their part because they don't really do much apart from um, sacking raban basically and bringing in fade rautha instead and mm. his solution is to basically bomb the shit out of the fremen it's like well, that's the thing is that they are pretty just much just more. uncomplicatedly evil in the film in a way that they are not so much in the books. That there isn't an uncomplicated evil faction, I don't think, in the books, and that does extend to the, the Harkonnens as well. Um, the, the bit that comes to mind is is because it's weird actually that they didn't bother introducing a character like Fader Arthur in part one when there was plenty of time in which to do that. Because if you introduce him earlier, which he he is in the books, you have more time for an interplay between him and the Baron. There's a quite an effective part in the book where you learn a lot about both of them from a mistake that Fred Rautham makes and the means the Baron chooses to correct him, which is not straightforwardly evil. It's clever. And he actually reveals about himself that he's not a power-hungry fanatic who wants himself on the throne. He is somebody who values loyalty to his house above everything else, and he wants his house on the throne, which is not something that comes across, I don't think, too much in either part one or part two of this, which... It's again, it's not a huge flaw. It's just one of the things that makes it less engrossing than it could have been, I think. And there's also something that I think they shot and they cut out was one of the uh, members of the Atreides house is mm. Ufa Howitt, their mentat, their human computer, who yeah. in the book is apprehended. He's completely absent. I know they shot scenes with him for this, but he's completely absent and he's, he's the Harkonnens pump him full of. A poison and then they give him the antidote to keep torturing him and then in the book he's kind of working behind the scenes to help the atreides out even though he's a captive of the harkonnen so i felt like you did when i watched the film there's not enough of the harkonnens in the movie it's all this reactionary stuff and it's it, it creates sort of a very one note sense of villainy in the movie and 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 baron harkonnen is kind of done dirty in that sense because his his scary formidable countenance or whatever is sort of removed from this film he doesn't do enough to make him scary and then what ends up happening to him seems a little lackluster i think yeah no i, I kind of agree on that one i think um what was the other thing i was going to pick up on the yeah i think i was never in doubt really about how the end was going to play out you know are the good guys going to win well it's 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 not like you're facing a really unpredictable enemy that's going to pull some some um, you know unexpected thing out uh, that you you know you never saw coming, and they've been strategizing for this. They're very much just like you know they they, they get beat because maybe they're overconfident or whatever. That's pretty much the extent of it. Um, the the pacing occasionally bugged me. And not from the sense that like the overall movie was boring or anything, but more just like there's certain things that Villeneuve included that he really didn't need to show us. Like and the example I used in my review was, um, and this isn't spoiling anything because it doesn't, you know, it's it's something that's just a a, a relatively minor thing. But um, a character shows Paul and the others where they have hidden a cache of nuclear weapons, and it's funny because you can totally tell that like the book was written in the '60s and like. Nuclear weapons, even in the far future, are this ten thousand years from now. <laughs> yeah, this like those good super, old nukes. 
this super <laughs> rare resource that only the most powerful factions have got access to. It's like fucking hell. Go to any like Eastern European country, you could probably buy one for like a few grand. But anyway, um, yeah. So they they've got these, and he tells them where they are, and most directors would just immediately cut to them like opening up the vault where they are hidden and recovering them and maybe a little bit of dialogue about like hey you know like all the great houses have got these things and uh we, we very rarely use them because they're like super important and stuff and we don't want to trigger like a nuclear war something like that easy but Vilnav will show everyone looking at the spot in like a cliff where the vault is hidden and then them talking about why it's hidden there and then cut away to like paul talking about them and like agonizing over whether he should use them and like oh i could blow up all the spice on arrakis with these things if i wanted to and then they open the vault then they take the weapons and it's just very lengthy and it doesn't need to be and it's probably an example of Villeneuve just not knowing when to just move things along when he could do it quite easily and that time that you spend with all of this could have easily been given over to fleshing out the characters a bit more this is a curious atmosphere for this film, considering I've seen nothing but very, very hyper praise for it, and I am cautiously optimistic both before seeing it and after seeing it, if that makes any sense. I think that um, a lot of people have been saying stuff like instant classic, you know, iconic for film, and that it'll be referenced forever and stuff, and I was just like, okay, that may be, but I feel like Dune 1, so to speak, um, kind of drifted out of public consciousness for reference and I, I i don't mean that that makes a film good or bad but when we get to a point of talking about film or stories we'll often reference and you you see films get referenced all the time and i think we could all agree one of the top referenced ones is lord of the rings mm -hmm. they just it comes up all the time as just a thing to go to of like how to do a thing but there's movies and tv shows that get referenced all the time and just the dune movie it just felt like people didn't really talk about it and one of the things that struck me when the first one came out was that a lot of people didn't talk much about the character work. It was more so about the breathtaking visuals, the incredible filmmaking. And I am inclined to agree thoroughly. I was very impressed. I thought it was a brilliant film, the first one. And the second one is, is no different. But I think that the word clinical is, is very much sticking to my mind because it's so accurate in the sense of um, when we get to our full payoffs of Dune 2, if you said, like, well, you, you can't get there without doing these scenes, and you can't get those without doing these scenes, it's almost like they planned it all out and we're like, yep, and we've got them all. And you're like, yeah, you did it. There you go. All the blocks are there and I followed the story and I understand why everything happened. And I, 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 I and I almost like feel like thumbing up and high-fiving the filmmaker and then being like, okay, that was a process, which is really odd for me, right? When it comes to film, uh, take a T2, for example, I come out of it and I'm just thoroughly in love with it. I thought it was incredible and I can't stop thinking about all the different emotions I had. Dune 1 and 2, even put together, I'm just sort of like, that was that was excellent, and I recommend it. Though I didn't feel a lot. Mm. It's the um the theme of this, and, and you know, people are talking about I, pacing. Um, I I was going to say the pacing for me is probably something I would be critical of, but in a very specific way, I ended up completing a, an hour and being like, oh, that was an hour. That went relatively fast, but I don't feel like I have a lot, which is you know regrettable. Like I, I'm like that, an hour. I feel like we could have gotten a shit ton done, and what we got done, I. I I enjoyed, but I was just like, shit, man, we're running on a film now. I wish I had yeah. more. I think that was less of a problem in part two than part one, but it was still a problem. But on, on the sort of the missing character beats point, I think that, that goes back to the decisions to, to remove, because Dune is a really interesting work because of you cannot actually separate the questions of character and theme from that book in a way that I think the film sort of tries to. So if you go back, and again, this isn't a spoiler because this is all in part one, you know, it opens with Paul being given the test by the Bene Gesserit with the Gomjabar. Um, and the, the idea is, across the entirety of the, of the first story, that is your setup to a very important payoff, which is actually quite subtly delivered in the final confrontation of that story. When Paul, who as a character is, is very tricky to, to get to grips with anyway because he has very limited agency given how much of this is about visions of the future and whether or not you have any say and control over those things having a character without agency is, is automatically kind of slightly hard to get on with but you're supposed to get to the end of this point when paul is is in this final confrontation and he's given a choice in how to approach that confrontation does he uh, effectively go back to the Bene Gesserit and accept that the power their power over him given that he's their product anyway in the world or does he chart his own course, which he's been trying to do up until this point, 
as a bid to stop this great Fremen jihad from controlling and taking over and wiping out huge parts of the universe because he believes that religious devotion is uncontrollable. A lot of that isn't really in either part one, or I don't even think part two. And that's because there's there's the the connect the connecting tissue between that first scene and the final scene isn't isn't really there. You've also got a couple of missing characters whose actions in the book and their fates in the book really impact his attitude toward this world jihad and the desirability of controlling it. Um, so you don't ever get the point of his sort of almost resignation into the sequel. Um, and all of this makes him in the film a much less interesting character, even academically, but I think it also makes him less interesting on an emotional level as well. I would I would agree with that. I also think they sort of made this story a little bit more simplistic that they never they never really stray away from the fact that he's still trying to avenge his father as opposed to having larger they always cut back to the signet ring and he really just wants to kill he's learned how to play their game of thrones to accomplish his goal which was to avenge his dad and i i i think you know he 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 makes a transition in this movie pretty quickly to to reluctant participant to messianic leader and to be fair i think timothy chalamet is a phenomenal job when he delivers a speech Maybe not Al Pacino and the Devil's Advocate, but a great speech nonetheless mm, to the fundamentalists. Movie. That is amazing, and um, but I still think he's doing it not because he believes, but because I'm still look. I, I'm going to take these mfers out because of my father. You, you know, what I would have appreciated, um, and what the movie could have sold us on a little bit more with this is just perhaps a bit more of um, a catharsis with him seeing all this destruction that he's causing. Mm. You know, like the when they're blowing up harvesters and like strangling the the spice production for the Harkonnens, and you know, it's it's frustrating the Baron because it's undermining his position. You know, Paul perhaps taking a bit more pleasure in what he's doing, and then even you know the the final confrontation which i don't want to spoil but like just maybe feel like he was he was into it a bit more it feels almost like he's doing it out of obligation rather than you know like because he really wants to and i think they, they could have allowed us to buy into the emotion of without, that a little bit more just by selling it a little bit more without spoiling anything which i'd love if we could have a spoiler section but i don't know if that's <laughs> feasible with the stream uh Without spoiling anything, the endings to several characters' stories in this felt very much like how would the, 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 they would deal with this character and that's what would happen, right? And it's like, yeah, checkbox, done. And it's done very quickly and, again, very clinically. Didn't feel a lot of emotion for several stories coming to an end. And some of them I was like, man, I, I feel like we didn't get loads of scenes in between this to really build that up. That just sort of happened. Well, it's, you know, it's like Vin, Villeneuve, he's been quoted as saying that he wants to make a movie without any dialogue, that dialogue belongs to TV and theater. And I felt in the first Dune, one of the fun things about like Lynch's version was just the scenes of people talking to each other. You like the characters and the scene where where he meets the Reverend Mother, where Paul goes and puts his hand, the Gom Jabbar scene and puts his hand in the box was so truncated. You barely have any time to enjoy what they're saying to one another and and the movie the the both of these movies are cut to the bone when it comes to conversations with with characters so you don't really get to know these people as much as you might want to and clearly stillgar is an audience favorite in this movie because he gets to be the the he's cracking jokes half the time so mm -hmm. we're all with him it's but he it's like oh it's stillgar he's like a character from the movies we love as opposed to being the beautiful tone poem that this whole movie is. It's nice to have a character that kind of stands in for us. So we understand we get a little bit more of what we get out of a traditional film, which is character development and, and enjoying the you know, interplay like, between them. I, to give an example, because it's not even a dialogue thing for me. You know, like Gurney Halleck, when he comes back into the story, it's like, yay, here's Josh Brolin. Love him as an actor. A lot of his stuff is pragmatic in the storyline, other than letting you know I I want to take out Dave Batista. My gosh, I got a big old oof. I want to get him. Yeah, that, like that was almost like yeah, it's like got to set up that confrontation for later. Well, and, and um, there's so much more you can do with that. I don't feel like they did a lot with it, other than stating that that was a thing that needs to happen. Yeah, the other thing that surprised me actually, because the first movie 
really builds Gurney Halleck up as like he's pretty formidable as a warrior. Yeah, you know he um, he's he's constantly like cautioning um, you know Leto to be on his guard. He kind of knows that something's up. He knows they're going to get attacked and screwed over and stuff. And like he makes that, that defiant stand um, when they're all getting ambushed at night time. Um, so he's really built up as like quite an awesome heroic character. And in this. A little bit flat, maybe like. Do you know what I mean about the I, block way of like? It's like what what is his thing? It's like he's got to deal with X character, and then he does, and it's like there you go, we've done it. It's like oh, you know, way yeah, and like there's a few like shots taken at him because like he doesn't know how to survive in the desert and stuff, and they're kind of like oh, get a lot of this guy, you know, he needs our yeah. help, and it's like almost like portraying him as like this kind of slightly doddery old man or something who doesn't know what he's doing, and I thought that's not really what you showed us in the first film. It was a slightly odd choice, and it just felt like his character had been truncated a little bit. I think it was uh, said, uh, I don't know if it was Platoon or several of you, but the Fade Routher, right, the, the Austin Butler character, he's um, his introduction, and by the way, praise to him, excellent actor, feels like both um, Dave Bautista and uh, Skarsgård's sort of Harkonnens have been drained of their story relevance in favor of him. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, they definitely took a backseat. It does kind of happen in the book as well. Like the Baron doesn't do a huge amount. It's like um, Raban and Fade Rautha become his like, you know, eyes on the ground almost, and they're the ones who are tasked with running Arrakis. And he just kind of steps back a little bit. So, I mean, it, it's accurate to the book. I just don't know how dramatically satisfying it is because I uh, like the Baron as a character. I was a big old fan of Skarsgård's Baron in the first one. I thought he yes, was fantastic. I was too. It was great. Yeah. great, absolutely great. I wouldn't even necessarily say that that bit was particularly accurate to the book because because you're missing that deal making between the Baron and Fade anyway. Um, you're not getting the interplay between them that explains the Baron doing the things that he's doing that explains why he takes this step back, which he does. You're right, um, but he just does it as as Mordor was saying that in in this one it's just because hey, there's the new big bad guy who's on the scene. He's the really obviously menacing psychopathic evil one, um, and he's just going to be our. our big bad for this film he's just the villain the film needs a villain it needs someone who can fight so he's there that's pretty much his job um you don't learn anything about him or about anyone around him from his presence in a way that i think you do in the book version no that's fair yeah um i i do i'm always drawn back to that quote that you gave me Mauler, about batista when he was getting cast in this movie, saying like, "Oh, I'm looking forward to a role where I'm not just standing around screaming oh, and, and oh, hurting okay. people." <laughs> oh. <laughs> Literally, all he does in this movie is screaming well, people. Is, specifically, I didn't want to say more specific things because arguably spoilers. But like, there's a meme about a poster going around where it just shows Batista screaming, and people are like, "What a dub poster!" That it's like, no, that's a good poster. Uh -huh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's what he uh, does. Yeah, I, I was, this is well, like, like when you, very underserved by the film. I feel his character and his acting. Same deal with Christopher Walken. Um, when you're you're going to cast him in your movie and then have him do very little, really. And fuck like, all. That's yeah. yeah. It's it's three, maybe four scenes. Two of them, he's staring. Yeah, he's just staring. And again, and it's like, like okay, maybe yeah. we'll get more later. Again, yeah. like in the book, the emperor doesn't do a huge amount there either. But like, I feel like if you're going to cast someone like him, you kind of want to make use of him a little bit because he's he's the his his official title is like emperor of the universe. Yes, I mean, you, you, with a guy like that, you you want to have a bit of presence to him. You want to do something with him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it sounds like everybody hated the movie. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, look, I, I'm I just only, wanna... it's only because it's interesting to pick apart these things that it is. I'm well, this about. is a normal conversation, though. This is like a st straight up normal conversation. We're going to talk about a movie we like seven, eight out of ten, probably, you know. Now let's pick it I, apart because that's what I we think, do. I yeah. think it's uh, a lot better than how much I like it, if you know what I mean. Like, I would, this, these are films like this. I'm like, I'm way, I need my characters, like, loads of character focused stuff. Yeah. It, like, so it's if it's smaller. Like, I like, could totally oh, oh, oh. see people loving this. I'd be like, yeah, and that's totally fine because I can't really see much wrong with it in terms of construction other than what I want to see. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, I'll, I I'll mean, ask you this question knowing the answer. Would you rather rewatch Dune or Serenity? Uh, fucking hell, dude. Serenity is amazing. <laughs> I could watch Serenity okay. 10 million times in a there day. You there you go. Well, it, uh, same I mean, answer. It, <laughs> it kind of goes back to what Platoon was saying as well. Uh, I think it was Platoon who said it anyway. Um, 
you know, having read the book, you know, you, you have a different perspective on it because you're looking for certain things to happen. You obviously know where the general story is going, but then you're looking for certain scenes, certain moments and so on that really stood out for you. And you get them and you kind of understand the subtleties of the world that the movie touches upon, but I I feel like it must be a very different experience to watch it as someone who knows nothing about the books. Um, you know, that I wonder me. if general audiences are still going to leave this scratching their heads. Like, what the fuck are the Benny Gesserit? Like, what is this abomination that's not allowed to exist that, you know, they keep talking about? What is this prophecy? What does that mean? Like, there's a, there's a shit ton going on, I guess, behind the scenes that the, the movie touches upon and hints at, but maybe doesn't give you the full story. And, well, it must be terribly confusing, I guess. I, I kind of appreciated that they didn't spell everything out for you. Like, mm. I, I, I treat me as an adult. I'm cool. I can figure it out. <clears throat> like, it was a little confusing. Okay. My my knowledge of Dune is the 2000 series and the Lynch version. I, I've tried to get right. through the book. I can't. I just can't do the book. Okay. I, I couldn't even read that book in prison, dude. It was like, that's... <laughs> 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 so... <laughs> But I got the fact that the Bene Gesserits planted that. I wasn't totally sure, but I mostly sure that they planted the prophecy, right? I, you know, that's and and but it still becomes self fulfilling, which I thought was a really cool concept. And certainly after watching this part and watching Lynch and stuff, you can see like how many other properties have just plucked off of Dune, including Star Wars yeah. and A Song of Ice and Fire, just to name of a couple. Uh, but I, I like the fact that they treated us like adults. I, I'm so tired of shit being spoon fed. I just wish there was a little more heart to it. You know, that's why Stillgard like stuck out for me. Like yeah. he, he's, he was great. He was great. And he's the, the one actor who had the audience laughing, you know, just, uh, yeah, just little moments of levity. Little moments. Yeah. Yeah. In, in such a very serious, serious story, which again, I'm fine with, but this is like hardcore deep, like straight up beyond nerd sci-fi like this is uh yeah uh, robert will know what i'm talking about this is like being a legion of superheroes fan like that's when you know you are like on a different level nerddom if you are a legion of superheroes comic book fan and that's what you get because that that's a whole different level of nerddom which i respect but uh that's what dune is and uh it is stark it is and that's what it's supposed to be and it's kind of amazing that they pulled it off as well as they did uh especially again not knowing the book you guys tell me you read the book is there more heart in the book is there more characters you can root for is there more no. soul? uh there, there's less i would say like this movie actually injects a little bit more personality and a little bit more um character driven stuff than the book gave you you know in the book i very much felt like pretty much everything that i was reading like every character was just a vector for someone's um machinations someone's um destiny someone's uh prophecy and it's like they they didn't necessarily feel like people pursuing their own objectives um and yeah there was no <laughs> there was basically no humor no joking it's a dead fucking serious novel um and very yeah. very hard sci-fi there's got to be a happy medium between like freaking marvel joking and and i'm serious all the, the time. this that's, this that's is just personal preference though you know i agree no this is i guess what i was gonna um hit upon really is that having <laughs> it subsisted on a diet of fucking marvel sludge where everything's a joke and nothing has any uh you know consequences it's all just like fucking who cares uh we're just there to like give you momentary laughs that's all it is it's just the yeah, cheapest and, form and of it energy. doesn't need to be humor just to Versi all that. yeah and so hu humanity and soul like that's, yeah, yeah so when you get something like this where it's like taking itself very seriously and this is a serious sci-fi story that it's not meant to be laughed at and all the stuff that's going on in it is like it's there's a lot of quite deep and meaningful philosophical stuff that this this tries to deal with all very nice um but it is as you say it does run the risk of becoming kind of clinical a bit soulless and it lacks that kind of human heart that you you need i guess to drive Con your story forward conceptually it's epic as hell i love the idea of a, a messiah going bad and like and it just it, i think that's a great idea uh but um <laughs> Uh, and we'll have to wait for the third one, which they did set up, which they definitely did set up. That's 
and, and see if that even i'm sure it's going to come out because i think this is going to do pretty well like um, most of the theaters are sold out oh, I'm, I'm interested actually because they're compared to the first movie there's a huge amount of hype around this one i don't know how they managed to generate it but it well, I, feels I, like I, everyone's primed for this fucking movie i think it's assisted partially by the stagnation of uh film right now it's it's got to be like well everyone's looking yeah. to this to hopefully pull us out of it somewhat and i think that it does somewhat like i said there's things missing in it that i'd like to see but you know I, again without spoiling anything it's in the trailer there's going to be a part of it that's pretty uh spectacular and that part is certainly very 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 engaging and extremely well made filmmaking wise that is worth seeing for everybody but, you know, at the same time, I have no idea. I can't, simultaneously, I can't predict uh, in any way, shape, or form the box office for this thing or its legacy, uh, Dune Part 1 and 2 together. I have no idea where it will, what it will be seen as in 10, 15 years from now. I think Uncle Remus has got the the, the ultimate answer for why this is going to be successful. It's the popcorn buckets. Yeah. <laughs> I, I did want to say... I would stick my hand into that. <laughs> I did want to say that, from my perspective, I do think that this is probably one of the greatest science fiction films ever made or pieces of science fiction cinema ever made because it, it it it's the kind of movie that i used to love from tarkovsky when he made look stalker which is based on a book called roadside picnic one of the great russian science fiction novels if you watch that movie it's like watching paint dry but it's also like a tone poem and it's it's easily one of the greatest science fiction films ever made Kubrick's 2001 or the movies of Terrence Malick like this is the thin red line of science fiction you know or or the the new world or maybe the days of heaven it's it's a just a different kind of movie and I think that we are used to the greatness of say Lord of the Rings and what came out of 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 Star Wars or we mentioned you mentioned Serenity there's there's a pulp element to all of those things that are throwbacks to the, those fun stories that began in our youth. Whereas this, like the book itself is not playing into pulp science fiction. It doesn't, it doesn't have any roots in flash Gordon or Buck Rogers or, or anything like that. And it has a totally different tradition and hearing Villeneuve talk about again not wanting to wanting to make a movie without dialogue I think if he could have made this movie without dialogue he would have mm -hmm. and and so I think that this film when I when I saw it I I was so blown away by by the achievement of cinema that it was and it didn't remind me of Star Wars as much as it reminded me of 2001 yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Because it, it, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and with 2001, a lot of people don't love 2001. They respect 2001 because it doesn't have, you know, do you think a princess and a guy like me? No, it doesn't have anything like that in it. And so I think this has more along those lines. It's it's an art film. This is a science fiction. I can't believe that he even exists, to be honest. Mm -hmm. That is a major, this is so the antithesis of a major studio movie. I can't even believe that they gave him the money to make this version of the film. I, I keep thinking, what was it like to be a studio executive where you're expected to weigh in with notes when you're talking about, well, we have to add this plot point. And I can't even imagine what it would be like to be an executive at Warner Brothers having watched this movie and then having to weigh in on it. What do you well, say? I mean, I'm, I'm pleased that it got made in the first place because it's really dicey. Like when I look at the box office for the first one, right? Cost 165 million to make, made 434 million. That is not a lot for a film like that. that you're talking maybe just about breaking even. That's it. And mm -hmm. so to greenlight a sequel, even that was pretty lucky that they did it. It got I done assume. dirty, though. I mean, the first one got done dirty. So. I, I think we could probably guarantee, yeah, we can guarantee this Dune 2 is going to do way more than that. It's probably going to be around the 700 million mark, I should imagine. I think so. I think the box office estimate's low. That's my opinion, though. It's like I 170 do. worldwide. I think it I think it hits 200. I like, I said, like it, you know, it's probably worse in LA, Robert, but here in Texas, like everything's sold out this weekend. No, here you can't. I'm going to see it again tomorrow at 7 a.m. Yeah, oh, because <laughs> at Universal, because you can't get tickets to any wide yeah. to any IMAX screen. There's a 7 a.m. show. The, There's a the 7 a.m. show. 7 a.m. show at Universal. Yeah, Jesus. 
That's How awesome. do you guys uh, feel about its rewatchability for uh, for the average person? That's a good question. I mean, for pure visual Ooh, spectacle, I, oh. it might be worth it. I don't know if, it, like, you know, as you pointed out, I don't know if they're going to get drawn back because they love the characters necessarily. It might just be the the world building and the, the visual spectacle might get people to go back to repeated IMAX screenings. I also think people, I, I, to be honest, I think younger audiences are going to be attracted to this because it is a visual spectacle and it isn't stupid. You know, it's yeah. requiring you to put something of yourself into it. I mean, if nothing else, it requires the viewer to meet the film on its own terms rather than pander. All we've been getting from for so long is these movies that are pandering to the audience and betraying the audience's trust. And I think one thing that this film does wonderfully well is it asks the audience to sit back and and not not be insulted, but you need to bring something of yourself to the film as opposed to just sitting back and expecting it to wash over you. Well, I think it, it's definitely you know a film that requires a bit of um, paying of attention, which is a good thing. And when I look at things like this and Oppenheimer, you know, hopefully both films will ultimately have done very well at the box office and captured yeah. a lot of general audience. It's great. It's heartening to know that films like this can be made and can attract a big audience, that people actually still have a hunger for stuff like this. Uh, I, I want more of this. Me too. You know, it might be sort of imperfect from, from like for everything that we want from a movie, but it's great to see that stuff like this is still viable and I want to see a lot more of it. I think it might also matter besides what the audience thinks of it and how often we go back and rewatch it or you know, how much of a general audience it gets. If it's incredibly well received as it seems to have been by the quote unquote professional critics, if this is being held up by them as a gold standard to which film should aspire, that can also have a positive effect because everyone who's in the industry pays attention to these people, whether they should or not is of course an easy to answer question no but nevertheless they want recognition from the club that they're in so if the club recognizes this as a high art film which is something that every other filmmaker should want to replicate then that also might be a relatively positive thing yeah, no, yeah i agree um, well uh, i mean sorry, I, I was reacting to the something that some, somebody said in the chat i wasn't reacting <laughs> what you said this somebody is said, this uh, <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's funny no they said play, <laughs> Blade Runner 2049 is better than the original. It's like, mm, okay. oh, oh, fuck off. <laughs> the original is fucking perfect. Like, uh, yeah. 2049 <laughs> never needed to get made. I love the chat. But, you know, I can like, love you guys. Tell you what, guys, because I, I want to I want to lighten the tone a little bit here. We talk about visual mm. spectacle, right? And we, you know, we appreciate films, productions, and so on that put on a good show for the consumer, right? And most of us are probably familiar with the the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory story, right? It's it's yeah. pretty it's a classic one, you know. It's yeah. been done mm -hmm. many many times in yep. cinema, in stage plays, in all kinds of things. Uh, I don't think it's ever been done quite like this interactive experience that was done <laughs> in Glasgow. And I'm just going to show you a little clip of what this was. It was fifty pounds a ticket, by the way. I just want you to know that. And this, this was in, you... this was in Glasgow, Glasgow, Scotland. <laughs> Let's see what it's like. It's I have to mute the audio as well because <laughs> 35 okay. pounds immersive Wonka experience. Parents are calling shambles. This this was it. So, you know, there you go. This is what it's meant to look like. It looks oh, yeah. Lovely. It looks lovely. Okay, cool. And this is what you got. What? No! <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I have children in tears, apparently. <laughs> Why? Look at these random props. Like, you know, <laughs> what is that even supposed to be? That, you know, it's that's a great representation of Hollywood right now. <laughs> when it, yeah. That's pretty much it. Oh my God. I, I think I saw something on the news about this and I didn't understand it. There, there was some poor actress yeah. dressed up as an Oompa Loompa oh, and she that... was meant to be at like a chocolate station and it just looked like, everyone described it as looking like a meth lab. And, and, I was and, thinking, and they, well, weren't, it, they weren't wrong. <laughs> it was Glasgow, so it probably was literally Oompa. a meth lab. The, the guy who they got in to actually play Willy Wonka himself apparently said that he was not given any breaks and so it, it, he reached the point where the boundaries between himself and 
Willy Wonka began to blur. Um, <laughs> so he just lost himself. <laughs> oh my God, that's... <laughs> I just love how it's just this bare warehouse and there's like one poster up. <laughs> Oh wow! Man. It looks like something that they they wanted to do, and then at the last minute, the night before, they had to throw whatever they could throw together in a few hours. Or yeah, yeah like yeah. maybe they planned it out, and like the artist who did all their stuff, like just didn't complete anything and lied <laughs> right. to them, and took off the money and did a bunch of coke or something. <laughs> it would have literally been like if you'd said to us, like you have two hours to put together a Willy Wonka, like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory experience. Go. I and mean, like you just have to run to whatever shops nearby and like buy whatever's there. Honestly, though, drink it. Like, I feel like we'd have enough shame to if we put all that stuff up. We'd be like, nah, we have to stop them from coming in. <laughs> it would be worse if they saw <laughs> have to stop them. <laughs> they, they can't, can't see this. There's a part where refunds and canceling the event are an option. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like that could only exist in Scotland as well. I, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> In America, they just would have they would have had that level of shame and said, "No, we can't offer this to the consumer because they'll just complain and get it shut down." But I feel like that's kind of what I would have got in my childhood in Scotland. <laughs> like that would be the norm, you know, of uh, of a fun day out, God. just like a grim warehouse somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I loved it. Uh, but yeah, apparently they had to issue about 800 refunds for it. Um, and the police got called because they were oh, so shit. bad. <laughs> the, the parents were threatening to attack. The, they were the so bad that you should be arrested. The Willy Wonka guy or the sad and Palumpa woman was describing how they, they did finally get a break and they just went into their car and sat there looking at their feet, trying not to look at all the children crying. And knowing they had another six hours that they had oh. to be there, it just sounds like the most chain thing in the world. Just <laughs> desperately <laughs> trying to deal with it. Yeah, I mean that's because these people had aspirations to be actors. You know, to to perform <laughs> on TV, maybe for the BBC, maybe even make the move to Hollywood and be in big budget movies, making people's dreams come true. And then you're in a warehouse in Glasgow making children cry. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Well, that's a sign from uh, your higher Def power that maybe you need to choose another career path. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe you really are cut out for Hollywood. Who knows? Yeah, oh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> they had a villain as well. There was a villain called like Mr. Unknown or something, I think, oh, in the back. God, His yeah. entire backstory is that he lived maker. in the walls and that he literally was just in a mask and he would jump out at people from behind this, this like black <laughs> curtain occasionally and scare the shit out of children who were already depressed. <laughs> So that's probably the best thing about the entire experience. What does that have to do with Willy Wonka? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> what I appreciate though is people, find it. people seem well, to be you... moving already to the point of like not directing hatred toward the people working at this place because like they're just average yeah. Joe's trying to make Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, the event I, the event planners. I think I want I want a full interview. Way. I want a full interview. I want to know exactly how this happened. I want every detail. I'm fascinated. <laughs> Hold on. Uh, I think I might have it. Let me see if I can bring it in. Oh my God. Full of scary face. Oh my God. Scare the great unknown. <laughs> Wonderful. I love it. It's a death eater. Let's see if it will appear. I mean, oh, think, think of the poor. Why did you do that? Smell <laughs> spicy. Terrible. Oh. Uh, the poor I'm kids of Scotland. There's right like there. nothing to do there anyway. <laughs> <laughs> ah, there's the. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> oh yeah, I forgot to say. Apparently, each child got one jelly bean and uh, <laughs> half a glass of lemonade. <laughs> that was all they oh. got. <laughs> wow. Oh shit. <laughs> Look at that! <laughs> Look at them all! We paid 35 pounds for this! I'm not a sightsy castle in the world. Oh look! It's a chocolate river! Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> wait, wait, let's see if this the evil dude's gonna appear. Hold on, I'll bring it forward All these kids are gonna have nightmares. That guy's got to be re-examined his career path. Yeah. At least I'll he's given it his all. In yeah. the face of in the face of adversity, the show must go on. I mean, yeah. 
enough coke will do that for you. I suppose it'll get you through the day, but wow. Wow. Anyway, that was <laughs> that's what we have to deal with in Scotland. If the so. Soviet Union had done Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, it would have been more <laughs> exciting and rich than that. I think so, yeah. Um, speaking about things that are exciting and rich, uh, Madam Web. <laughs> like, like their Lord of the Rings version? The comedy Lord of the Rings version? Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> Gollum looks like cabbage. Yeah. Uh, yes, Madam Web is a movie which is out, and it's reached a grand total of $78 million worldwide, which is... Yay! Well That's done. high. Well, well done for you, Madam that. Web. But um, it's not... It's not quite hit the mark. What would Chris Stockman say at a time like this? It didn't quite resonate with audiences <laughs> the way the studio had intended. Yeah, that's probably the, that's probably the diplomatic way to put it. Um, but some of the stars of the film have got theories about why that is, and one of them is right here. Um, Isabella Merced is that the word? Merced. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. She said it failed for one simple reason. For the same reason that the Marvels or Bird of Prey failed, because the male audience still hides a deep contempt for everything that is starring strong, yep. independent women. Oh, God. The truth is the truth, I guess. Sure. I mean, that's definitely the reason Birds of Prey <laughs> failed and the Marvels. It wasn't because they were bad films that no one wanted, for sure. Didn't Thank somebody you. get the, the audience breakdown anyway, which showed that the majority of the audience, even for Madam Web, was male? And actually, the people who hadn't turned up to see it were women under the age of 25 in particular. Yes, that's so absolutely true. The general percentage is about 70% male for comic book movies in North America. So roughly 70% of the audience is generally male. Uh, for Madam Web, it was 56%, I think. So a slight change, but still more than half the audience were male uh, of yes. the 26 people who went to see it. Which is generally your movie audience, and it'll skew slightly different from rom com to superhero film. And if you go to comic books, it's much worse. It's like ninety five to five percent. Uh, and uh, what 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 did those three films have in common besides sucking? Uh, they were all directed by uh, women too, right? So they were directed by women, mostly written by women, for women, starring women, and women didn't show up. I blame women personally. It's all I mean, your fault. Yeah, they, they had the chance to support it and they didn't. But I mean, yeah. I literally made a video specifically talking about this when I broke down the demographics of different genres. And you know, uh, if you want to, if you want to attract female audiences, make a musical or make a drama or make a, a romance movie because that, unfortunately, is what they go to. That is what they gravitate to demographically. What do you mean, unfortunately? <laughs> You're allowed to like those things. <laughs> sure. I mean, um, yeah. But uh, yeah, the, the point being, like, if you if you want to attract a male audience, then make a superhero movie uh, and cater it towards them. Make an action movie. Make a thriller. Um, you know, those kind of what... things that men generally watch. And like, as much as they try to skew the demographics in different gen in different directions uh, to get that magical 50 50 they're never going to do it because shock horror men and women are into different things generally speaking yes you get that's over what that. I mean by, it's ah. not unfortunate that's just like whatever you know what i mean like if they're interested in seeing movies like that women i mean it's like i yeah, know but but it's like they refuse to accept this reality and so you get these constant attempts to pander to a female audience for superhero movies or for action movies or whatever and it doesn't exist you're, you're pandering to people that are never going to watch your film you know, the, the women Ever. who are into superhero movies are into them already. You're not going to attract new ones. There's not some magical market out there that you just haven't quite reached yet. And and so the more you try to do it, you're just driving away your existing audience. You know, the, look at what Marvel have done. You know, it, there's no... Um, the MCU isn't just something that uh, like people dreamed up to make fun of it. It's a, it's a straight up thing. They have tried to cater to a female audience with their latest, what, 10 movies. And by and large, they've failed. And not only have they failed to attract that female audience, they've driven away their male audience at the same time. Yeah, it's bad business. That doesn't seem to matter to them. And you're right. You're absolutely right. Uh, you know what? With Madam Web, maybe put superhero movies in your superhero movie. That, that would be a good start. That's like a throwback to 20 years ago. When, when Hollywood was embarrassed by, well, 25, 30 years ago, when they were embarrassed by superhero movies, where they wouldn't put a skull on the Punisher's chest 
the fucking Dolph Lundgren's movie. That's that's kind of crap they're falling back on. And they just crapped it out. And uh, at least it was funny. But uh, yeah, you're forcing something in that will never, ever happen. You're going for an audience that doesn't exist. The modern audience doesn't exist. There's just the audience and they still like good stuff. Uh, and And men and women are different. I know this is like really just hate speech that I'm spewing right now. But uh, like you said, that the Marvel made the MCU. They they made it and they announced it. 2018, we're going to put more. Uh, half of our characters are going to be women. More than half of our characters are going to be women. From Kevin Feige himself, and that's what he did. It's exactly what he did. And uh, how's that worked out? Now you can't tell the difference between the Marvels and Madam Web, between Sony Marvel and Disney Marvel at this point. And Robert, you pointed it out, my friend, because I watch your streams. The the big savior savior movie this year is it an MCU film? It's a Fox X Men film. Well, yeah, that's yeah. yes. I mean, Deadpool and Wolverine. But you know, Gary, I wanted to point out too that the audience for superheroes, especially comic book superheroes, has always skewed predominantly male. Mm -hmm. And what brought women into the fold, which I love to see, was I started noticing more and more girls in comic book stores to get like Neil Gaiman's Death miniseries. Or when anime started coming in, uh, girls were watching Sailor Moon. Girls were starting to play video games. And they were focusing on, on more female-oriented characters from the get-go. And even female characters in, in Marvel and DC comic books have always skewed more towards men anyway. There's never been comic books from the, the big two that have necessarily uh, been targeted toward women. You know, women had things that they were interested in for their own sake that that were more designed. And that's why manga has become uh, so popular because there are comics that are made by female creators that are directed towards women because Japan doesn't have that kind of weird gender thing that we have here in the United States now that has taken over and run rampant. And that's okay. You know, it's okay that that there were comics that were created and targeted toward women, but the superhero paradigm is inherently a male one. I mean, I know from my own YouTube channel, as much as I'd like to have a larger female audience, 96% of my audience is male. As much as I would like to address all different kinds of issues, because the paradigm and the whole the whole mythology behind superheroes <clears throat> is something, it goes all the way back to Greek myth. And yeah, it, it, Robert, it's, it's, the bat. So I would sell Batwoman, Supergirl, Mystique. You know that when they had so uh, uh, Emma Frost had solo issues. Yep, not a single one of my female customers picked them up ever. No, because they were still all part of that male yeah. superhero paradigm. And what's so interesting about that is, is there's nothing wrong with this. No. And now it's being it's it's being portrayed as there's something wrong. I mean female characters women are looking for more or look i got sucked in to watching general hospital in the 80s because my mother loved this one soap opera i'm like i'm not gonna watch some soap opera you know but then i didn't realize that <laughs> there was there was there was clandestine there was an evil secret spy agency and there was things that <laughs> i liked and so my mother got me sucked into this soap opera but the but the soap opera was an inherently feminine form that was directed at, at at housewives because they were home with their kids during the day. It was not a it was not a paradigm that was for guys. That didn't mean we couldn't like it. I got sucked in. I watched it for years. But that doesn't mean it. it, it but it's still it was targeted toward the female audience. And now it's 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 almost like well we don't want to say that. We don't want to admit that. So we're going to try and do the same paradigm and force everybody to like it rather than give people tailored like look the notebook anybody can watch the notebook with ryan gosling but it's more of a female skewing story and that's okay yeah that's okay. Well, it's, it's the same you know it's the same concept that like there's probably not many girls who dream about like beating up the bad guys and saving the day and like you know being this all-conquering heroic character it's it's right. more of a distinctly male concept it always has been. That's yes. why yeah. the superhero genre is skewed so heavily. Well, that's a men. suicide to de, uh, you know, demasculate, de, 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 just get rid of the masculinity. I can't even talk right now. Uh, from Marvel, from superheroes, from Star Wars, from everything. Uh, that's it was just pure suicide, and now we're seeing the end result. 
and and they're not going to be able to recover from this. They can try all day long. You're not going to be able like, okay, on their best day, let's just pick Marvel. They turn Marvel around in three years. Like nobody's going to give a crap in three years. We're going to be, the society is going to be moved on. The the normies. I mean, that's the biggest question about Dune is Dune's going to play well to, to, to hardcore genre fans. And, and, but how's it going to play to normies? I think probably pretty well, to be honest with you, but that's rare. You know, like Oppenheimer, what what Marvel and Star Wars have completely lost is the normies, and and they are yep. very difficult to get back. They're very fickle. So, uh, it, you know, watching Patrick Bet David's uh, interview with uh, Gina Carano yesterday was hilarious because it was like watching your normie relatives trying to figure out culture. You know, so it like, <laughs> <laughs> and they're getting names wrong, and it was funny. But uh, at least it's getting out there. But that tells you like how low information. It is, and it, we're nerds. This is stuff, like, if Robert didn't have a channel, Robert would still be going to all the nerd sites every day and reading that shit all day like I do. And watching you guys. Yes. I mean, and, and, and because it's been in my blood my whole life, and it's not going to go away. And what's interesting to me is that, look, the Disney brand, the Disney princess brand, it makes sense for a company like Disney to want to increase that part of their brand because it's always been an important going back to the fairy tales their very first feature film was snow white you know and if you we, we did have pinocchio which was about a, a puppet that wanted to be a real boy but then you had cinderella i mean those all those classic cartoons were were directed toward the female audience and that's okay and and i know that they want to do that but they're trying to force a square peg into a round hole Rather than recreate, look at characters like Moana. Everyone likes Moana. I love The Little Mermaid. I love Beauty and the Beast. Beauty and the Beast, you know, the, it has a creature and the dudes in it are dicks. But I still like the story of Belle and that animated film was nominated for Best Picture and I liked it. And I can watch it as a guy. But the same is not necessarily true of superheroes. And they're trying to subvert a genre that doesn't need to be subverted, one. And two the audience they think is there for that subverted film isn't that no. audience that they they're trying to cater to an audience that isn't even there. They thought they could give up on the old audience. And this is what comics did too. They thought they could, cause there's this new, there's this potential of a new audience out there. So let's completely give up on the one that got us here. Uh, and it's, and it's suicide. And that's a very corporate mentality, by the way, Yes, very corporate mentality and commoditizing all this stuff. And uh, that that mistake comes in with uh, politicizing. Politicizing was suicide as well, uh, especially just stuff that really is supposed to have mass appeal. Uh, so yeah, it, it, it and and yeah, maybe we're moving into and well, they're going to have to move into a new era where they make more serious films like Dune, you know, and and, and this is going to be such a, like you know I, my 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 review called it the trash and uh, the treasure in the trash because that's what it is. You know, um, I don't know if Horizon's going to be any good, but at least it looks like a serious Western. You know, uh, I just watched. Uh, we watched. I don't know how many people watched uh, Shogun. Pretty yeah. good. I want to watch it. You, you mentioned it's, it to me. It's it's really good. good. Pretty good. And I love the first Shogun miniseries from forty four yeah. years ago. Have you read the books? Yes. Yes. And it, so, is it fairly accurate to them? It is. Yes. Uh, it, it, the storyline is is is. I mean, they've taken a few liberties yes. to dramatize it, but it's beautifully made, and you can tell that the people behind it cared. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a. It, it's really really beautifully done. Totally I, at least for there. Yeah. two episodes. For two episodes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It could all fall apart in yeah. the last day, but you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's all right. Masters of the Air is starting to do that <laughs> for sure. Oh no, really? I was going to jump into that one after Silent. Uh, it, it's generally been quite strong. It's been like it's had the odd like uh, bottle episode where you just think, okay, they're killing time here, and it's just there to you know um, plug the gap. But there was one, the most recent one. It was very filled with twenty um, twenties writing. There was like a subplot there, and apparently it was written by the director of captain marvel so um which which one the the nia da costa or the ones before no the ones before okay okay so they, yeah like they captain are good marvel. either <laughs> they suck too uh yeah. <laughs> but yeah so like that explains some of that but uh yeah did on I the plus also side. read sorry there's uh, isabella merced who, who gave us the quote that we kicked off with didn't she also say that she'd signed on to superman legacy because she'd read 
what the yes. script is going to do with Lois and was really, really impressed. And yeah. so this is so another I example can... of proper female character writing. Or so, something. so yeah, I can give you the quote here, actually. She said, uh, right, so the actress of Peruvian origin, because apparently that's really important. She praised James Gunn and said that she's just accepted to be hot girl in Superman Legacy. And when she read the script, she said that Lois Lane is really the protagonist of this movie. Superman is the symbol, but she is the ideal brought to action while being a normal woman and real. Okay, well, for one, thank you for showing us you don't know shit. If this if this quote <laughs> is real, by the way, I, I know I, uh, yesterday we couldn't confirm it. Uh, it was something okay. that's been going around on Facebook, and and we haven't been able to attribute. Like uh, my friend Ryan Kinnell did a video on it, and he has or he talked about it on Geeks and Gamers Daily, and they weren't able to attribute it. But if they said that, like Lois Lane's never been just a hot girl, okay, like ever, she's always been kind of the heart and soul of Superman, not the main character, obviously. Uh, yeah, that's another daunting task there with James Gunn and Superman Legacy. Too many characters in a movie. You know what? That's where we know we're in trouble with the superhero movie when you can't just make a Superman film with Lois Lane. It doesn't need anybody else. No other superheroes at all. Just Superman. Uh, and 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 now everything has to be Uber team ups and multiverses, which are fun. But if it's still healthy, you can make just a solo Daredevil TV show with just Daredevil. You know, that's not going to be filled with a bunch of other superheroes. And we'll see if that works. Uh, there was another thing here that one of my mods actually, <clears throat> the Outcast creative, he uh, he made me aware of this, and I just thought it was really funny. Uh, it's a new show um, airing in the UK called Curfew that's uh, getting worked on right now. Uh, it says it's a thriller where all men are bound by a strict curfew from seven pm until seven am every night. <laughs> <at> their, <laughs> movements, their movements tracked by an ankle tag twenty four hours a day. Here's everything we know so far. It's a tense edge of your seat thriller. Uh, so it's set in a world where men live under curfew every night and an attempt to protect women, but something goes terribly wrong. Um, the Women's Safety Act uh, makes, <sighs> makes sure that men cannot go out at night between 7 p.m. and 7 a.m. and their movements are tracked 24 hours a day. But when a woman's body is discovered brutally murdered during curfew hours and left on the steps of the Women's Safety Center, Police officer Pamela Green believes that a man must be responsible. In a world where men are bound by the curfew system, however, her theory is rejected by colleagues. It sounds like a fantastic I, comedy. I, I just I looked at this and I thought Disparu is going to watch every episode of this thing and he is going to review the hell out of it and <laughs> make a ton of money. <laughs> I say That's... go with it. Sure. <laughs> God. I, I could just imagine the op-ed pieces being written. It by sounds the like intersectional. Fem, it sounds like intersectional feminist porn. That's what it sounds like. Well, the, but yeah, it I, has I, to like be. A, saying, has to be a comedy. <laughs> the, I can imagine the op-eds getting written as we speak, saying like, you know, it's fiction right now, but maybe we should consider it. Hmm? You know, it's <laughs> sure, okay, yeah, because right. women are so they get along with each other so well. <laughs> No, I, I'm fully in favor of taking half the population and massively curtailing their civil rights. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, seems that, totally works. fine, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I hope uh, I hope curfew is every, I hope it gets every bit of success that it deserves. Where's, where, is it like in the UK or is it's this going to be? It's a UK one. So yeah. hold on. I'll, uh, I'll see if I can pull up the details of who's making it. What happens if like a power line goes down late at night? Who's gonna fix it? Uh, I Trevor, know right? all the men are under curfew. You have to, wait until, you have yeah. to wait until morning. Or or there's a fire. Yeah, what if a single woman has a spider to kill? What what's she gonna do after seven o'clock at night? Uh yeah. Who's gonna so... open that jar of pickles for that single woman after seven PM? <laughs> So, uh, right, yeah, so it's not to be confused with another one, which is called Curfew, which was made in 2019. Uh, it's a new British series. It's going to be on Paramount Plus. Oof. So that's a sign of quality. Oh, <laughs> you mean, <laughs> hey, Paramount Plus only lost a half a billion dollars last quarter, Critical Drinker. Things are looking up. Yeah, it's kind so of about that fifth season of Discovery. Discovery's right around the corner. That'll get them subs flying in. Robert Meyer Burnett, 
Wow. How, how excited are you about Discovery, Rob? <laughs> oh, you know, uh, the, the long, dark night of the soul will finally be over. I mean, you know, I watch that trailer and I think about what the Star Trek franchise has meant to me over the years. The, the directions it sent me on in terms of reading and learning about things like political and philosophical history and reading mythology and listening to classical music, believe it or not. All of those things. And I looked at that fifth season trailer for Star Trek Discovery, and I'm like, this is where this is where evolution has led us mm. down a dead end, down a cul-de-sac of nothingness that looks like everything but what Star Trek is. Um, it just made me sad, and it, 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 it's not because of of uh, my disdain for certain kinds of people. It has to do with where I would hope that humanity would arrive in terms of being an inquisitive, clever people that hopefully we 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 want to grow into something that's better than the sum of our parts. And I look at Star Trek Discovery and it ain't that. And that's supposed to be in the 31st century. It's mm. interesting. Oh, well. it's like at the moment, like Moller and I have been working our way through the Star Trek movies. We've been doing watch throughs of them. Yeah, and they're great. What a treat they are to just rewatch. Yeah. Like I've watched them a whole bunch of times. Like it's, I know it's Moller's first time doing it, but even then, I've seen them like a bunch. Like every each one, I've probably seen like six, seven, eight times, and it's still a pleasure to watch them. And I just think it's such a positive, optimistic view of our future. Um, the characters are compelling. They're interesting people. They're good at what they do. They're smart. Uh, they're learned. They're mature. And then you get things like Star Trek Discovery. Star Trek Discovery is none of those things. I don't. No. Yeah, and I don't understand how this came to be. <laughs> how did it, it last? Five it seasons. Lasted five seasons. Didn't make a damn penny for the streaming network. Uh, nobody wants it. I, I, it's just painting yourself into that corner where, uh, you know, you, you overdo with content, you're o overrun with content and you can't cancel the Star Trek show that you promoted as the most progressive one, uh, with a black female lead, you're painted into a corner at that point. Is I remember I was at Star Trek Las Vegas and they, they said, what, what, what makes Star Trek discovery stand out more than any other Star Trek show? And <laughs> they said diversity. Nothing. Diversity. Of course they did. It's remarkable, actually, because I remember when so sort of season one, two, and three were out, and people were even then starting to complain that this is just people flying around in the far future talking about their feelings, and it yes. became like it's the feeling show, which is a meme. Didn't expect them to really play up to that with season four's reveal being that there are aliens out there, which lo and behold just communicate with you via feelings. <laughs> they actually piss feelings onto a shield and talk to each other. It's it's quite special. Yeah. <laughs> I can't wait till the three body problem comes out. I really hope it's good. I yeah, really hope people are going to grapple with with those issues I because mean, it's far away it, from what we're seeing in Star Trek. When we're talking about this having five series as well, or five seasons, sorry, is it just pure? Um, I don't know, stupidity. Right. Well, I was going to say like, it almost feels like spite. Like you know, we know you hate this, but we're going to keep making it just so we can claim it's a success because it's like been so good. We made five entire seasons of this thing. The, you know, the, that, that's kind of what it feels like. It's like when they took, you know, the Jodie Whittaker's Doctor Who. Everyone fucking hated her. They were totally disengaged from the, the franchise at that point. But they gave her three seasons because every other Doctor had had three seasons. So they had yes. to give her the same number, even it, though no one cared. It's the exact same thing. And Robert knows probably better than I the, the politics behind, like, uh, Secret Hideout and Kurtzman. It's a grift. All right. These are a grift in the sense of they're trying to pretend to like something they hate they just don't like or don't really care about not even hate just not care about and that's star trek they just wanted uh, a franchise they went to the franchise store got their hands on a franchise and that's what they got and and it, it shows well it's absolutely true you can look at you can look at merchandise sales like eagle moss rest in peace yeah. you know they did a lot of these great they did great die cast star trek ships and the ones that didn't sell were the discovery ships the same is true of xo6 the company that's making these beautiful high-end star trek uh six scale action figures the ones that haven't sold are saru and burnham yeah but they have to make them because that's what the license uh the license uh they have to agree to do that and even the licensees who are making these things aren't making money mm -mm. and the question is why 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 is it that that there are there are new franchises how can you know it was amazing to see how good house of the dragon actually turned out to be 
when you had the creator of the original material involved? And why is that so difficult? And why is it that they want to take franchises that have established formulas and try and go against those established established formulas for an audience that doesn't exist? That's the thing that is strange to me is like, who do they think is going to watch this show? And and where are they to come off thinking that like Star Trek or Marvel comics uh, don't have the uh, timeless ideals that would resonate today? Because they fucking do. That's, <laughs> That's why, why they still, still resonate. <laughs> <laughs> I, I you know you look at this stuff like like whether I mean the X Men, the Fantastic Four, all of the modern sure Captain America goes back decades before, but if you look at the core characters of of Marvel. These are all characters that were born in the 1960s. Even Black Panther, I think, appeared in 66. Yes. And and why not rely on these characters that have existed through decades, through different periods of history, uh, through tumultuous eras, and they're still here? And why do you feel the need? Why do people today feel the need to come? Well, I mean, I know why they feel the need to, because they want something of their own. I get it. So make something new. Makes sense. They, they can because, like, when you hire activists instead of creatives, they're incapable of creating new, interesting things. All they can mm. do is bastardize and, and cannibalize the things that other people made and pass it off as their own work. That's, also that's the, the, the problem. Like, you don't you don't have good people working there anymore. You don't have good writers or ideas for the thing anyway. I mean, I think when it comes to something like Star Trek Discovery, you can sort of follow the logic in the early days when you've got Paramount launching its streaming service and what does it have to offer. Same thing with Marvel putting out so many Disney Plus shows is that you know, you've know you launched this streaming service and you're immediately in a very, very competitive market. So the more IPs you can boast that you have, the more people will say, hey, look, all the Star Trek stuff is on Paramount. I'll go subscribe to it and watch all the Star Trek stuff. Turns out, though, that the only reason they did Discovery was because they wanted the name recognition in the brand. They had no particular idea of what Star Trek stories are supposed to be nowadays. Um, so when it when you have no idea for the property that you're in charge of, you tend just to hand it over to anyone who happens to be employed already, who might have some vague sense of where they want the story to go. And it just turns out that most of those people happen to be the ultra sort of progressive types who think that, yeah, Star Trek was always political. That means it must always agree with me. No, and, you know, we had another something drop the other day from another comic adaptation, a remake, which was The Crow. You know, and I, I, Alex mm. Preuss is the crow turns 30 years old this year, as I like to call it. Uh, it's, it's, it's goth Star Wars, but, um, that the original version of the crow is an adaptation of jail bars. Uh, I think seminal comic that really spoke really to a lot comic. of people. Yeah. And, and I thought it was a terrific adaptation. It's different than the comic, but it's a great adaptation. And it, it's also kind of like the blade runner of goth movies as well. And it's beautifully made. And now we're given a new image of Eric Draven. And I, I wasn't quite sure what I was supposed to feel from that. It was the difference between Heath Ledger's Joker and uh, Jared Leto's Joker. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what it feels like. It's I'll like, yeah, oh, I'll wait to see it, but we'll see. Yeah. It's like, I get that you worked out for this, but like, that's not really what the crow character is meant to be about. It's not about just showing off your abs. <laughs> you know? Right. Yes. It's, yeah, and it's it's an interesting movie when you look back. That was what 1994. Yeah, four. 30th that, anniversary. It's coming coming out on 4K. You, you, I can't wait to get that new transfer. It's about time. Four years before Blade, like that was your first proper dark comic book adaptation movie. I know you had the Tim Burton Batman movies, but they weren't dark in the same way that The Crow was. No, when that came so, out, that's where everybody was saying that's the template. That's how you're supposed to adapt a comic book movie, and they just didn't. Yeah, and but, also, I mean, the music too. The the, the fact soundtrack. that it has a banger soundtrack, not just a Graham Revel score, but all the songs, you know, that sort of came out of the uh, sort of pseudo grunge. Henry uh, Rollins doing a cover of a song about Ghost Rider for the Crow movie. Yeah, that's fucking cool. And the and the Cure <laughs> during their song Burn. I mean, it's an incredible yeah. soundtrack. Uh, there's two soundtrack albums for it. It's yes. great. Yeah, and I have them both. And uh, I was working at the warehouse at the time, Robert. Remember the where? Oh well, yes, the warehouse. And we played that thing all the time. It was great. It was good times. <laughs> good times. Thirty uh, years. Jesus Christ. I know. Yeah, thirty Gosh. years. Oh, I feel old. But, the uh, last thing I was going to cover <laughs> just before we we did a few super chats was um, everyone's favorite actress in the Marvel universe, Brie Larson. Um, yes. 
<laughs> you know, the, the Marvels wasn't the greatest success ever. Um, and so people have started to ask, like, well, what's our future in the, in the MCU? What's Captain Marvel going to do next? And so they straight up asked her um, at the SAG Awards. Um, they said, um, yeah, what was it? Variety, I think, that asked her about it. Um, said, uh, what's next for Captain Marvel? What's uh, what MCU projects can you tell us about? So apparently, she shook her set, she shook her head and said, I don't have anything to say about that. And that was pretty much all that we got. Um, kind of makes me feel, um, and a lot of other people have suggested the same thing that she'd rather just get out of the MCU. Bit of a development uh, I don't think from the um, other time, right? Where she said, I don't know, does anyone want me to? carried on kind now of, if... yeah because i don't think it's a case that marvel's done with her i think it's more that she's done with them and i don't blame her in the slightest if i was her i'd want to get out of marvel and just not have to play this character anymore clearly it's not working i think similarly with sony and marvel it's about realizing who has more leverage and i think brie larson is like you know what i feel like i don't need you i think you need me more than i need you right now and uh you can consider the fact that she did the, you know, the YouTube thing for like a year, right? Yeah, very, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Really, yeah. very yeah. clearly contractually. Didn't take any of our advice, by the way. Oh, it, who could, that wasn't even going to happen, of course. I think that the whole thing was obviously like, a, you got to do this to get a better image between, you know, Captain Marvel appearances, and that she probably agreed to it like contractually because it's like, well, it's a huge opportunity. I think. Robert Downey Jr.'s Iron Man gave everybody the wrong impression as actors of what the potential of the MCU was going to provide them. And uh, it's only now that they're all starting to realize and probably getting told. Recently, we had that quote from uh, Ray Winston, right? Talking about how it was a miserable experience uh, being a he part of the MCU. He said it was soul destroying, apparently. Yeah. And he, I think it's funny as well because he was asked to tone down his performance as Dracoff. Like, really? Yeah. That was toned down? When, well, Dracoff was a fucking cartoon like uh, of a character. And apparently, that was the toned down vision, which, to be honest with you, it would have made the film better if you let him loose. Ray Winston's yeah. fun, yeah. but um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, just... the, I have the clip for reference if you want to see the clip. Oh yeah, let's have a look. yeah, yeah. Hopefully, I got my sound turned on here. Uh, we're gonna catch the last part of this, and it's it's really you got to see this in context. And what's true? Can you hear it? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. But then yeah. Course, there are times when nervousness means that you're just sort of like, this is not the right thing for me. Yeah, very that's quickly, Marvel. That's yeah, quite just knowing which is which. Can you tell us a little bit, bit about Marvel and what's coming up for you, your next Marvel project? I don't have anything to say about that. Ooh. Boom, right to credits. <laughs> she just shut that one that down immediately. It down. Shut it down. I mean, Woo. it could be that she's under NDA or something, but I feel like she would have been a bit more positive about it. Like, hey, we're working on stuff, but I can't tell you anything right now. You it just seems if more in, like, yeah, I just don't want to talk about that bullshit anymore. I want to in like out of my life. five years or whatever, she comes out hyper against Marvel, says it was crap to work with them and that she never wants to be there again. I feel like she's going to rise in the ranks of favor with us <laughs> in terms of like, I, she's got a fun. So. I have to I say got, that I got more respect for her already after that. Uh, yeah, well, her interviewer abs. who <laughs> yeah. alone. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I just I can't imagine. You know, whether you like the first Captain Marvel or not. I, to be honest, I thought it was okay. You know, I, I as a sci-fi B movie, whatever. But the thing is, it made a billion dollars. I know it was between Infinity War and Endgame, but you're an Oscar-winning actress, and you made a billion dollars for the studio. And in your second movie which could have been the road warrior it could have been godfather 2 it could have been the empire strikes back you have two characters from a tv show that yeah. you have to share the screen with i mean in hollywood history this is not how sequels work yeah and i understand what they were trying to do but they should have i mean they could have done anything you knew that during the five years that thanos had snapped away half the universe that she was having a hard time dealing with what was going on on a cosmic level you could have done some epic story about her trying to quell a civil war in space or you could have done anything but instead you had to make this goofy basically the marvels is is a sitcom i mean you've literally got florkins running around eating people to save them from a spaceship that's coming apart i i watched that movie and i thought to myself this this is what you're following up a billion dollar franchise film with and you're you're saddling Brie Larson, who's won an Academy Award for Best Actress, with this. I mean, I thought that it was ill-conceived from the very beginning, and I, I 
can't understand of all the things that Marvel has done, I do not understand why you would follow up a science fiction film. I mean, you have the Kree Scroll War that you you, you could have done. You could have they gone into the Nova skipped. Corps. You could have yes. gone into Annihilation. You could have gone into introduced the Shi'ar Empire. You could have done anything, and they gave us a sitcom. It it actually, smacks, the so other thing it, about that film is that it makes more sense. The MCU makes more sense if you just pretend that the Marvels doesn't exist. Precisely because of how much it skips and how little it actually does. I mean, the film resolves everything it introduces within its own course, with the exception of stuff that it actually accidentally mentions, like the the collapse of the Kree Empire, which doesn't really make sense when you look at everything around it because it gets no mention in, say, Guardians of the Galaxy. It doesn't accord with Secret Invasion, which is another one that's probably better ignored. But I think to, to the answer, the question is to why you would follow up Captain Marvel with the Marvels. It's just because that Captain Marvel as a character was not there because they had a story to tell with Captain Marvel, even in the 2019 one. She was there sure. at that point because they thought, well, we know, roughly speaking, who's going to be dying at the end of Endgame, and we want someone to take over the role of Mantle from Tony Stark to lead the next generation of the MCU, and we want that to be a woman. So we'll have Captain Marvel, and she can be that person, and we'll just throw her in, irrespective of how that actually works with the rest of the story, which it doesn't particularly well. And now they've got to the point where they, they you know, pick up the pieces and they say, well, what have we actually got to do with this character? And it turns out there's nothing. So they just nothing. do this sitcom thing, which is as irrelevant as it can possibly be. Yeah, I, I was I was gobsmacked. Uh, I, I just I do not understand what they were trying to accomplish with that because they had the potential to take a character that was middling at best that people didn't like and they could have given that character a, a, look every character is one great movie or one great story away from being restored we've seen it in comic books all the time a moribund comic uh has a great creative team that suddenly comes on and and turns it into a huge best-selling comic and does a definitive run on it you know, Frank Miller on Daredevil, for instance. That could have happened to Captain Marvel. But oh no. I, know. I think uh, it, it always gave the impression of a film that nobody wanted to make. Like, I just got the feeling that like, mm, the writers yeah. didn't want to tell the story. They just cobbled together whatever came to mind. None of the actors particularly looked like they wanted to be there. It, the, the direction was apathetic at best. It just felt like a project that nobody was passionate about. And it was made out of obligation. And like you say, it's a shame because they must have known what was riding on that. Um, a really, I don't know, a really spectacular second movie might have redeemed the character to some extent. And made and you could have done interesting things that we haven't seen yet. You, you know, the Marvel's cosmic characters are deep. There's a deep bench of interesting characters they haven't even touched on. No, th yeah. they're a joke now, Robert, because they, they've gone so far into comedy with it. Like, they, you couldn't do an Annihilation. Annihilation is like high-stakes sci-fi. It's yep. freaking brilliant. It's probably the, one of the best crossovers I've ever done. Uh, there's no way you can do it, well, because most of the characters are missing or wrong. And, uh, <laughs> y y you know, so just read the comic. It's better. But, yeah, I'd imagine, like, from a career point of view, I think probably Brie sees the mcu as the worst thing that she ever did um yeah like she already had a fairly successful career as far as i understand it she'd already won an oscar she'd done um a mixture of you know dramas and and you know interesting independent movies and you know bigger blockbusters like kong skull island and stuff like so there, there was a a fairly solid base as an actress to build on and then she took this role and it just killed her momentum because you know all these interviews started coming out people took a dislike to her and that is a tough thing to get over as any actor probably knows i mean she and... was in a movie called short term 12 that i loved you know i thought it was a terrific uh independent film and um how how she wound up in that i i don't know and she you know she was a, the lead in a, a tv series in uh, last year called lessons in chemistry that i don't think many people watch but she was quite good in it yeah, it was it was quite a good uh, quite a good show, but and I almost feel like if Captain Marvel hadn't happened and she hadn't done all that stuff publicly, then yeah, I know. perhaps lessons in chemistry would have been a lot more successful. People would have given it more of a shot. Yeah, they would have. They would have. Yeah, I just yeah. you know the uh, the squandering of of so much time and money and effort in these less than successful properties. I, I don't understand it. I don't understand what Sony did with Madam Web. I don't understand during the entire production of that of that film how how that film exists. And then you have writers on the red carpet. Gary, you you had one of these writers clip 
it's out saying uh madam web didn't have a backstory so we, backstory. Can do whatever, we don't have to we can do whatever we want i'm thinking what madam web's a mutant you know <laughs> and why don't you why don't you even uh, or, and let's not read our subject material where if, if right. you look at if you look at the great like captain america the winter soldier that's right out of Ed Brubaker's Captain yes. America run, and and it's like you that, even that though leads he, into to oh, Bucky. Well, Secret Invasion, Bucky, Bucky getting the shield and becoming Captain America. Uh, yeah. All, yeah. all of that, ignore that. And why not do the things that it's all right there? It worked. For you? And, like, like it's already tested. Like these are hits. It is tested. Madam Web would be a great side character in a Spider Man, like the Roger Stern stuff. It's freaking amazing. Uh, it's one of oh, my yeah. favorite. All the you, nothing stops the juggernaut. It was one of my favorite Spider-Man stories ever, uh, and uh, th that's she's in it. She's a big part of it. But she, you can't. You I, can't. I, I did love how they asked Dakota Johnson about like, would she be interested in coming back for a sequel? And I just thought, <laughs> to do what? To sit in a fucking chair and be like blind and paralyzed? Hell <laughs> like, yeah! Not a hell of a lot to do as an actor. Hey man, <laughs> like, easy yeah. money. Okay. Yeah. That's her origin too. To, to build up to that to be our origin, I was laughing so hard by the end of that movie. Oh my god, it was funny. Uh, the I thing where she had a gets hit by a firework it. underwater. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> dude. When the guy got killed by a pee, uh, the uh, the two other people in there and us three were just busting up laughing. It was so funny. <laughs> I we, loved it. And our coverage on Eva, we still didn't even know by the end if she was paralyzed or not. Uh, I said she got paralyzed by the firework, and Fergie was like, "I thought she was just in the chair because she was lazy." <laughs> <laughs> we don't know oh like know. you know helps her move around because she's blind no, no, like, yeah i don't know it's, but no like you don't understand like if you can't see they can't trust you to walk around by yourself because you might fall down stairs or trip over things they, or had it right they, they have had to put you in a chair julia carpenter spider woman uh with sydney sweeney just two hours of that hanging upside down i'm fine <laughs> I, I i i'll watch that yeah the biggest crime against cinema is that they had Sydney Sweeney in like, you know, the most buttoned-down blouse, Dude, it, crappy it was ensemble. Crime you can imagine. Since the Eternals, like, uh, completely covering up Selma Hayek's boobs for two hours. It was just freaking. That should not be legal. Okay. This, this is what happens when you let women direct superhero movies, right? <laughs> I'm just saying. Well, if you had <laughs> Catherine Dude. Bigelow direct a superhero movie, it might be good. It would there be good. Go. Zero yeah. Dark She's Thirty, few, Near Dark. Yeah. I mean, yeah. she she's uh, she certainly Why is knows. She, what happened to her? What has she directed lately? She hasn't done much. I mean, I think the last film she directed was Detroit. Okay. Um, but if you she's go not, back, she's and you not watch Spring Chicken anymore. I think she's no, like she turned. She just 60. celebrated her seventieth birthday. Oh yeah. She's okay. Yeah. Old. Okay. Maybe yeah. So time. yeah, and she. I mean, you go back and I think Strange Days is the most unsung science fiction. I film love ever. Strange Days. It's Unbelievable. Great. Yeah, the, Unbelievable. I mean, yeah. Detroit was twenty seventeen. So you're talking what seven yeah, years ago now? She's probably retired. She's probably just retired. Like, good for Damn. her. Damn. But she did the Hurt Locker and Zero Dark Thirty. She did K nineteen, The Widowmaker as well. I like that movie. Mm. Mm -hmm. She pretty good. She pretty yeah. good director. Always like her for Point Break as well. Legendary. Yeah. Point Break is uh, awesome. Love that movie. Uh, yeah, I love the fight that Hot Fuzz. She's also uh, so one much of as well. James Cameron's either ex wives or girlfriends. I can't. Ex wife. They were married. Ex wife. Yeah. And he because he wrote uh, Strange Days. Yes, he did. Uh, I want you to cover a few super chats if we could, gentlemen. Sure. Let's do it. Lovely gentlemen of the panel, because I'm sure there's going to be a bunch of questions for all of you. Uh, first of all, TGV Monster says, I just want to say that after watching the Rogue Elements trailer, Ryan Drake is hot. That's all I wanted to say. Not about hot, but it's a good trailer. <laughs> Thanks, good man. Good trailer, I'll, dude. I will pass that on to the actor, though, who'd be very pleased to hear that. <laughs> uh, he also says, I'm also going to see Dune 2, so if I don't catch this stream, so long, gay boys. <laughs> so long, gay Thanks, boys. Man. I just watched that movie. God, it's good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Fantastic. Uh, Metal Metal Face Rosie says, check out the Frisco Kid, a comedy western starring Gene Wilder and Harrison Ford. It's a yes. rated classic. Really good. Really good movie. Uh, JS Pena, I'm planning on watching Farscape soon due to comic campaign on Kickstarter that takes place after the series. Uh, when uh, when does who's, it start? Who's to doing start? that? Who's doing that? I didn't know. It. There's a there's another. No well, idea. I mean, there was a Farscape comic series already, but they're doing another one on Kickstarter. Yeah, I didn't hear about that. That's cool. Email me that, please. Uh, yeah. The I question don't know, is, what, does, does Farscape start to suck, guys, or just did it yes. get cut down too soon and they did the no, best they could? Uh, season four is pretty shit. I'm not going to lie. Okay. <laughs> like, right. 
I there, think there's a lot of shit episodes fun. in there. It's I like, like it. Yeah. It's not like it's not the same as the way some TV shows fall off. Like it's, I would just tell people like go as far as you want with Farscape. It's like Babylon Five. Farscape's arc is like straight up like the ending. rise and fall. Like season one, uh, yeah. pretty good. Season two, excellent. Season three, superb. Season four, bleh. <laughs> like absolutely fell off a cliff. But I, I, I still love it. I'm rewatching it again. I'm freaking. Lo- I love it. I love that show so much. Yeah. Uh, random stuff it says I chalk up a lot of Hollywood's financial trouble to them failing to appeal to younger generations because younger talent would rather go independent online than try to integrate into Hollywood. I mean, yeah. I hope that's true. It is true. Why would you want to go through like go through all that craziness? Uh, probably, and if you're young, you know, completely destroy your childhood because Hollywood eats their young, and just go out, go go out on your own. Although, <laughs> being on the internet when you're young is not great for you either. Yeah, just gonna, say, right. just gonna say, maybe wait till you're older. Wait, wait till you're old and shriveled up and cynical like we are, Gary. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <Yay. laughs> uh, Stephen Bobo, hey drinker, I just want to say that yesterday was my birthday. Happy birthday, man! Uh, so on my day off, I'm playing Final Fantasy Rebirth. Plus, I posted your Iron Claw review on our wrestling Facebook page. Cheers! Thank you very much for that, man. And uh, yeah, that's the result of like us being so far behind the states. And I actually waited for it to come out here so I could go see it. And it was great. I loved The Iron Claw. I thought it was a good movie. Um, but yeah, I was so far behind the times, I don't think anyone cared by that point. Um, Metal Face Rosie says, Drinker, watch Justified, you massive. Is Justified good? Is it worth yes. the time? Okay, cool. Yes. Ba- Banshee. Yeah. Banshee. A little, a little better. Watch Justified and Banshee. Both really freaking great shows. They both came out right around the same time. Uh, Elsie Le Pen says they're rebooting The Naked Gun with Liam Neeson, written by Seth MacFarlane. The Zucker Brothers movies were genuine, were a genius comedy. Don't think this will measure up. Why would you reboot Naked Gun? I don't understand. They'll it's... never be as good as you know, classic Naked Gun. But I, I find Liam Neeson a very curious choice. Um, he's I don't know if anyone's seen the work he did with uh, uh, in the in Ted Two and in Life Is Short, where he plays it completely straight and serious in explicitly like comedic scenes to the point where it's like, Hmm, I don't know if that's Leslie Nielsen energy, but it's, but it's interesting. He's apparently very interested in doing more comedy because he's been like typecast into serious action, man. Yeah. I think it's a great idea. I mean, like I think it's a horrible idea to remake the naked gun, but we need comedies again. So do something. And, and somebody in the chat pointed out, Leslie Nielsen has letter rip on his fucking tombstone. <laughs> <laughs> that is pretty awesome. It's fucking Chad. Uh Elsie Le Pen says also, how about that Willy Wonka experience, eh? Well, we covered that. Yeah, it looked like quite the experience. Um Istaria Azul says, Would any of you accept Brie as a co-host? Does anyone predict a tell all one day or a sudden eagerness and desire for the male gaze? Uh, uh, I don't know. Usually they get to a certain age. Well, yeah, yeah come on, Brie, we'll we'll help you on. Yeah, when Chrissy, when Chrissy goes on maternity leave, Brie can su- can substitute for Chrissy on FNT. Isn't isn't the usual trajectory as well that they exploit their sex symbol status until they hit their mid to late thirties, and then suddenly it becomes like really problematic? And they oh, they reject the it they completely. Were... Yeah, and they're like, oh, I felt <laughs> yeah. so exploited back in the day. It's well, like, yeah, I'm then... looking at you, Scarlett Johansson. <laughs> Then they have a midlife crisis. Then they play a witch. They have to play yeah. some kind of old hag or a <laughs> yep. witch. That, that's usurping the patriarchy in some way or another. The end. Uh, Go for Broke says, Little Platoon, I saw your Echo review. During that video, you said that you've never seen Netflix's Daredevil. What? what? Ooh, tragically, what? no, I have not. I have not. I, I have to admit it. All right. You have to right after this. It's good. You have I'm to watch it right now. Way behind the times on that one, but uh, no, I'm, I keep hearing it, it, it good things about to go it. To the top of your list, like whatever you're watching now, needs to just wait. Well, Daredevil: you... Born Again is coming out soon, isn't it? That'll be an excuse. I can go and watch the oh, original oh, one. Oh. And no, no, no you better watch that instead. Just watch <laughs> the Netflix one. <laughs> oh, and no, forget no, about instead. Born Again. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Robbo says, "Knew that the Crow remake would flop as soon as Bill Scar- Skarsgård was cast. I like him, but you need a conventionally handsome star like Brandon Lee who transforms into a freak, not an actor who's ty- typecast for playing creeps." I don't know. Like Brandon Lee wasn't like a conventional sort of heartthrob look, I suppose. So, 
have, have you guys seen the trailer for Boy Kills World? No, I no. think it's mm-hmm. right up all of your alley, but it stars Bill Skarsgård. It is absolutely bananas. I don't know who made the movie. You know, I don't know how it got made, but go watch the trailer for Boy Kills World. I do like him as an actor. I think I he's, feel like he's very, very talented. He's like and a couple a of the for- bright movies away from being considered one of the best actors of all time. He just just needs to think, get the correct yeah. roles in the right place. I think right he just he just needs to break away slightly from like the the freaky kind of uh, weird characters and just maybe play a couple of more <laughs> straight up conventional dramatic roles. Somebody in the chat called him Post Macro from that. <laughs> 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 Uh, uh, that's good. That's Andrew cool. McCarty says the YouTube Holy Trinity clinical drinkler longest gay Gary hail. Thank you. <laughs> Gotta be good you at something. Trinity. Yeah. Uh, Cold Brew says DEI changed the industry. When I see a minority on screen, I know for a fact that they weren't chosen for their skill, but for their race slash gender. Uh, minorities who are actually great actors will be lumped together with all the DEI hires. What are your thoughts? I think that's possibly mm, true, yeah. And that it is very true. Who are, who are genuinely talented, and yeah, and it, yeah, we we talked to a couple of guys who are very concerned about it, and rightly so. And uh, it's supposed to be about meritocracy, but now that question is there, and you you only have DEI to blame. They're going to blame the audience. They're going to blame you guys, but no, it's 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 their policies that have brought this on. Um, Sean Spencer, Moeller, Donner cut, EFAT movies when. Ooh. I don't know, but we got so many to do in general. After that Lord of the Rings one, everyone's like, we need you to do... Because I think most people thought we only did like bad movies for the most part, but now we've done a couple of good ones where we just break down things behind the scenes and what we like about them. They're like, okay, now do all of the good movies. <laughs> now do yeah. every good movie. Okay. Never. We, we have some... Right. Like you have a bunch in, in like coming out over the next couple of years, right, Mahler? Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, arc. a couple decades. But I'm down with the Donner Cut. If that ever happens, you better invite me. You're going to do The Hobbit movie. next. Everyone wants us to do that after the Lord of the Rings. No. One. <laughs> I'll do it. I'm, I, I'll watch The Hobbit. I'll, I'll watch it and enjoy it. I don't care it's what anybody so says. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> okay. Better than the uh, prequels. fights of uh, just how bad it is, exactly. <laughs> it's that better than the prequels. I'm going to uh, say cirrhosis, it. Cirrhosis of liver. <laughs> <laughs> My God, I didn't know Shere Khan from the 1967 Jungle Book was going to be in the bar. Hey, Shere Khan, did you ever find that man cub? What the fuck? <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't get it. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Robo96 says, given the current <laughs> filmmaking landscape, it's so refreshing and satisfying to see such a classic IP in Dune be given the respect that it deserves. Hope the studio give Villeneuve the same classic artistic license with Messiah. Hopefully they do. Yeah. Is it Messiah like a short book though? Yes, uh, it's very Chris, short. Yeah, Chris was telling me that they have to like probably mix in Children of Dune and Messiah to make a movie. Do you think? Wait, just or... wait. Isn't Children of Dune where it gets really weird, or is it further on? It yeah, God, God, God Emperor is when it gets really weird. Yeah, that's oh, when okay. the guy turns into a worm. It gets progressively yeah. weirder as Frank Herbert gets higher and higher and higher to write them. But uh-huh. It's not like a, a cliff edge. It's just sort of it gradually builds up. Him and Philip K. Dick like their drugs. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was the same man. What can you say? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Bruce Banner, Gary, make sure when Mahler watches uh, Batman the Animated Series that he watches Phantasm after season one and Sub Zero oh, yeah. after season two that ends uh, the animated series. Oh, the those I, year was basically the MCU before the MCU. Yeah, existed. I didn't know I was in charge of that, but that's what you should do, Mahler. Is that like uh, release order continuity or like all just yeah. events? Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Cool. Uh, cirrhosis of liver hey drinker you've met Mauler, yes uh is he six foot ten and 285 pounds like he sounds like he is give mm-hmm. him the share can a microphone and crank the bass up to 10. <laughs> okay what uh, <laughs> I, I don't get it <laughs> i don't think you're six foot ten was it six foot five or something that you are six foot four or five i always forget yeah you forget, you forget? There's not yeah. a tape measure long enough. Uh, measure you're this tall, Gary. It just doesn't matter anymore. You, you, I, it doesn't. You're as tall as my son, by the way. My oldest. As long son. as you can look down at everyone and laugh, it's great. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, Jordan Pendragon, happy leap day. I raise a friendly glass to you all. Oh, yeah. It's 29th of February today. That's right. Leap year. Great. 
I can't wait to get like get February behind us, though. It's always a shit yeah. month. Yeah, Kellogg's to birthday today. Happy birthday, Superman. Nice. So, can- canonically, okay, not the Clark Kent one, but the Kal one. Um, Andrew McCarty, Gary, how? I guess what they're trying to say is how far into One Piece have you gotten up to? It feels like this would be a show for you, other than talking. Oda is the best world builder. Uh, I'm still in a, what's the, the first part of it. I'm still in the first part. I, I kind of stopped because I got busy working. I'm going to jump in. Now, the yellow flash is at uh, episode like 400 or something like that. So he's a little <laughs> far further ahead. Uh, but I, I'll, I'll get through. I'm going to go back to it. I freaking love it. I've watched the live action one more times than I care to admit. So, <laughs> after Avatar, I, I watched it again because Avatar The Last Airbender on Netflix was just bad. I gave up after episode two of that show. You were smart because it gets worse. Yeah. Also, yeah. it made me want to arrest anyone who puts like a friendly animal in the scene so their main character can just expose it He's directly put- to the audience should be arrested. That, that <laughs> It's such a shit little trope, but people keep doing it. Because um, I'm, I'm done with Silo, I'm going to jump on One Piece. And Silo is good. I like that. Silo looks good. also good. Yep. Did you, did you watch the whole season one uh, little platoon? I have, yeah, I watched all of it and then I went and read all the books because I found those kind of interesting as well. But yeah, I thought, like, besides the middle when it gets a little bit too mystery boxy, it recovers quite well. Yep. And the overall yeah, thing it, is pretty entertaining. I think it, like, hits the ground absolutely speeding and then it sort of, you realize, like, wow, there's a lot of episodes that have gone by and I'm not as interested as I was at the start. And then toward when it starts to finish up, you're like, oh, 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 oh. Yeah. I'm getting yeah. all the answers again. Hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, it actually it finishes only halfway through the first book, so there's loads of and there's another four books I think, and he's writing a fifth one. So there's there's loads more that they can do with it, and it gets pretty interesting, like world building wise. So I'm hoping they carry it on. I like the drip feed of the intrigue. Um, I kind of wish there was more. You know, I, I felt like a couple of characters. We should probably shouldn't turn this into a fucking silo discussion, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I recommend. Is I'll say there. Yeah, that's the quick version. No, I'm just uh, I'm getting into it now, so. Looking forward to plowing on with it. Um, RRTNZ says, uh, Hail Drinker and your mighty panel, I highly recommend the new Shogun. Thoughtful, beautifully shot, faithful to the book, and solid performances all round. Did you catch the Chuck Norris in Dune 2? He played the desert. Nah. I thought he played the sandworms, to be fair. Nah. <laughs> Chuck Norris played the nukes. Um, but yeah, Shogun, let's give it a watch. What part of Chuck Norris played the sandworms? <laughs> That's the question. Uh, M8566 says, Hey, Drinker, what's your favorite episode of Deep Space Nine and why is it in the pale moonlight? Well, there you go. You got me. It was it's the basic bitch choice, I suppose, for Deep Space Nine, but it's a pretty fucking good episode. Um, yeah. That's where you get uh, the morals start to get compromised. That's where Cisco becomes a very different character mm-hmm. and he's okay with it. And that monologue at the end, some good stuff, man. Um, Master of Puppets says, Hey, all. Every time I hear about Disney, I remember the scene in The Dark Knight when the Joker burns that pile of cash. Drinker, your movie's looking good. Can't wait for it. Thank you very much. Looking forward to showing it to everyone. Um, DSFGRR says, Chuck Norris once threw a grenade and killed 50 people. It then exploded and killed five more. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Michael Brocky, any chance we could get a drinker recommends for Netflix's Daredevil before we see how Disney destroys it? I hope all is well and drunk. All is well and very drunk. And yeah, I'd love to do a recommends on Daredevil. Um, it's got to find the time, I suppose. But yeah, for anyone who's watching, I do recommend Daredevil. Watch it. It's fun. Yeah. It's a reminder that you can do shows like this and they can actually be really good. You know why we're lucky, even though streaming is the hardest thing in the world to do? uh is like i'm sitting here i'm watching farscape and all this other stuff my wife's like why are you watching this again I'm all, it's work honey it's work. <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's like, it's like the, it. the social vision of a tax write-off it's like why are you using so much time to watch those shitty shows from millions of years ago you're like uh excuse me is this for work okay i and, i have to talk to Mahler about things so i need exactly. to remember a lot of stuff yeah you make me think, by the way, as well. Look how crazy it is—the amount of bad superhero TV shows we've gotten. When it's like you see, you were just talking about. Um, uh, you know, I, I was just thinking about like you know, like Alias. That's kind of like a superhero TV show almost. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, I was thinking Buffy and Angel—they're pretty much superhero TV. They are. Angel's straight up superhero TV show. It's like yeah. we figured out how to do it like 20, 30 years ago. 
Yeah, it's just funny and to then, think about. And then we forgot. And Heroes, okay. at least the first season of Heroes. First season, yeah, very yeah, yeah. good. That was a really great show. And then it, wow, that got destroyed. It wasn't. That it wasn't. Yeah. Rider Strike. Huh? Mm. Uh, Next one. Story. A man says to his wife, "What would you like for our anniversary?" And she says, "A divorce." He says, "Wow, wasn't planning on spending that much." <laughs> hey, Mr. Luca says, "Could a Star Wars show work in the style of Game of Thrones? Maybe set back a thousand years and families that have to fight for control of maybe a solar system." Does it have to end terribly, or can it be good all the way through? <laughs> that I, that's a you. good question. <laughs> It, it has to be with, good all the way through. Okay, mm -hmm. put my foot down on that one. It, it has to it has to feature a, a girl who's the key to everything. Yes, because it's Disney Lucasfilm. Um, Ag says Dune Part Two comes out on my birthday and will probably be my favorite movie of 2024. I've got my ticket ready. Cheers to you all. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy it. And yeah, the we'll thing is, it. as much as we had a few issues with it here, it probably will end up being the best movie of the year just by like lack of competition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, easily. I, I don't think it's even questioned at this point. Unless something amazing, unless a Godzilla minus one comes out, which is an S tier movie, by the way. That's that's something that's just absolutely up there. One of the best movies I've seen in the last decade. 100%. Potential for um, Wolverine and uh, blah, why, why can I not remember his name? Deadpool. I say, Deadpool. Deadpool. I can't want to say Daredevil for some reason. Like, why can I not figure that? Because he's a better character. Death. Yeah. Star potential for that to be a good film uh, I think... good uh, i think it's gonna be a hit i think it's gonna be a huge hit good i don't know i just hope it's not one long gimmick yeah that it actually has some kind of because i thought the first deadpool was quite good you know they yes, kept it the, is very good they, they kept the budget down and and they did a great job going in between the character the goofiness and the fourth wall breaking and an actual relevant story uh Wolverine, Deadpool versus Deadpool and Wolverine has the potential to be just a goof fest. And I hope that there's a legitimate story. You know, people have said that the villain is Cassandra Nova, uh -huh. who was Xavier's twin sister from the womb, who Grant Morrison introduced to in New X Men. I don't know if that's true, but that's interesting. That intrigues me to see what they would do with that because I did like Grant Morrison's X Men run. Many people good. don't. Yeah, yeah, I like. No, I like it, and I thought she was a really. How do you make a new X Men villain? That was a, and I thought they did a good job with that. Hit and so miss we'll of parts, but you know that's that's Grant Morrison. You know, isn't the yeah. um, isn't the TVA going to be in this Deadpool? Yeah, that's thing. the problem. Sadly. I'm hoping like all we saw them like in the trailer was that 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 was it. Yeah, like, but I've also heard killed. that it's the TVA from the Fox X Men universe. Yeah, which that interests me too. Because, you know, Matthew McFadden, I love him all the way back in, in the UK. It was called Spooks. Did you ever watch the TV show Spooks in America? Yeah, it's called I watched MI5. That, yeah. He was great in the first season, Tom Quinn. It was our little answer to 24 back in the yeah. day. Yeah, where they would kill good. all the main characters. You never knew yeah. who was going to die on that show. It was the woman who got her head shoved into a deep fat fryer that was Oh, man, the that was the first ones. season. Yeah, in, like episode brutal. four. Yeah. That was that was bad stuff. Um, Ouch. Next question is uh, Ghost of Drinker's Liver. What is everyone's favorite instance of an actor playing against type? Mine is Will Ferrell as a soft-spoken tax auditor in Stranger Than Fiction. He was quite good in that, actually. Um, so yeah, actors playing against type. Mm, I, I quite liked um, I thought, uh, Tom Cruise in Collateral was quite a good one where he's like just oh, a yeah. straight-up villain. Uh, Robin Williams when he played in uh, One Hour Photo, and yeah, oh, I think he was great. in like Law and Order SVU or something. I remember seeing clips of him in it, and I was like, "Shit, man!" He probably could have played a lot more villainous characters, and he never got his you know proper chance to do so. One yeah. Hour Photo is uh, it needs to be seen a lot more. It's almost a forgotten film. It's so good. Yeah, it's good. Um. The Javiator says, Hail Drinker and hopefully Mauler, if you're actually here this time. Which Hello. He is. Yay. What's a dead genre that you'd like to see revived and who would you like to see directing or acting in it? Also, please say my name right, lol. I said Javiator. That's that's the way you do it. And I've decided that's how you pronounce it. But yeah. uh, a dead genre. Are there any dead genres? The Western, mm -hmm. maybe? 
I mean, can I say comedy? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I was going to say screwball comedy. You know, like a, a yeah. fi- 40s or 50s, something like a Some Like It Hot. You'd think that that could play well today, but who knows? Well, like I almost want an Austin Powers 4, but I want it made in the two th- early 2000s, not now, if you know what I mean. <laughs> like, I, we didn't get to have it, but because I, I don't know, I don't know if it works if it was made today, but God, I could do with a movie that just, you know, lampoons movies uh, really well. Even, even like the scary movie at its best or whatever have you. Yeah. Just yeah. Fun, you know? Yeah. Comedy is dead. I, the Westerns are, are coming back. I mean, like Yellowstone, kind of one of the most popular shows in America. And Costner's uh, two part, huge two part movie yeah. over the summer, Horizon. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I think hmm. that it's not completely. And, you know, the Yellowstone had a bunch of spinoffs that arguably people are saying are better uh, with 1883 and 1923. I like Tulsa three, King. I know that's not a spin-off, Tulsa but King like, is still awesome. Taylor Sheridan. Yeah. yeah. Tulsa King is awesome. They're going to air that on CBS on regular network television this summer. Smart. Very yeah. smart. Uh, I, I, I could never get past the comment about um, Yellowstone yeah, Nova. It's like Taylor Sheridan cast himself as the most badass rodeo cowboy that's ever lived <laughs> in his own show. I <laughs> <Aye>, sure. <laughs> Why not? Yeah, Why not? It. Watch his Joe Rogan interview. It's pretty good. Uh, Taylor Jordan, Sheridan. Jordan Pendragon says, I skipped out on seeing Madam Webb after watching your review. Smart. Uh, the <laughs> thumbnail of Dakota Johnson and Sydney Sweeney at the film premiere on your Chaso video was perfectly sufficient. Thanks, Drinker. Well, you know, I, was, I understood my audience and I appealed to them. There you go. <laughs> and and as, people what they want. as extrapolated on that with one of the greatest thumbnails we've seen this year. Uh <laughs> What did you see? You've seen that one, right, Drinker? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did he, did he sweetie? Did he Photoshop that. I don't know if he did, but it's he put the word B and then there's Sid, Sydney Sweetie's boobs and it says M and it just says boom. And she, like it's genius. <laughs> it's 10 out of 10 thumbnail. That's what you want to achieve, content creators. Just use Sydney Sweetie's boobs. They 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 actually work out. Oh, yeah, for sure. Oh, yeah. Uh <laughs> Sorry, the way you phrased that, it made me think that, like they were pumping iron in the gym or something. Like her boobs work out. They do. They, I, I think they're kind of like their their own. Like they they uh, are sentient. Her boobs, like uh, yeah. <laughs> it's like Chrissy Mayer. She's like they got their own Twitter account. Yes. They, yeah. <laughs> uh, Crit Nature says, "Hey, drinker, how about you and Maul are organizing European uh, fan open bar event sometime? It would be great to finally shake hands, talk movies, and compete with you in in your drinking abilities." What, what do you say, Mog, or should we organize a fan meetup? You should. For open bar someday, sure. Let's just do it. Like we'll, we'll have a true open bar where we'll just hijack a bar and like everyone can just come in and get absolutely shit faced. Yeah, so organize it in a bar. Just some some like local chill one that there's like a thousand people just like... <laughs> <laughs> That's what oh, we what's did. happening? <laughs> yeah, That's I I'd be up did. for that. Uh, Crit Nature says, Mogger, um, fuck, I can't say this. Better your friends, Reduers, Rusua, for far, Ehoid, Neat, Ech, Banshee. Are you having a stroke? Yes. Possibly, yes. I, I'm well, just reading it verbatim. And, and in response, sure, yeah. Maybe. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I uh, I don't know. I don't agree with that completely. Oh, well, okay. I know what parts you disagree with. Yeah, I don't yeah, with you. I have issues hold, with that. Hold on, I'll, I'll put it into chat so you can see it in all its glory. Because I'm just, I'm trying to say it verbatim, and it's difficult. Why? Uh, no, that's, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Looks pretty straightforward to me. Pretty straightforward. I've... Yeah. What's your problem? Wait, wait, wait. I'm gonna put this in Google Translate. <laughs> see what it. See what we end up with. I got a feeling it could be dirty. Detect language. I'll just I will let it figure out what it is. Okay, yeah, there we go. What do you think is the most underrated movie of all time? Ooh. Ooh. All time? Oh, that's crazy. Um, I mean, my and, I have and, a and frame of reference is it like when it came out or like just over all time? Because you know, Blade Runner is pretty underrated when it came out. Uh now it's not though, right? Now it's not. <laughs> no. I think we are, I think we Red. should take it in its entirety. So like okay. movies that are generally like looked down upon or just don't get much recognition, and you think they're actually fantastic. I have a stock answer for this, and it's Anthropoid. <laughs> it's that it's movie good. I watched with you, Drinker. It's the one that basically had like zero coverage. No one knows it exists. It's an adaptation that exists alongside a couple of other ones that have way more eyes on them. 
that uh, Killian Murphy is fantastic in it. Um, yeah, you're not the first person to say this. Where where is this movie out on disc? Should I buy this? Yeah, you could definitely. Well, I, I thoroughly recommend it. It's one of my favorite war movies that exists. It's about the um, operation. Which one Anthropoid, is it? Obviously. Which one is it? I'm sorry. It's called Anthropoid. It came out in yeah. 2016. Okay. 2016. Um, and it has, you know, like how Inglorious Bastards, I think, has two of the top scenes of all time in film for tension. Um, Anthropoid has another one. Uh, it's specifically when they're trying to do the assassination in that film. It's uh, expertly done. Very big fan of it. And just I've never seen it mentioned literally anywhere. The only reason I knew about it is because a friend of mine saw it on an airplane when he had no choice but to watch something. It just happened to be on. He was like, what the hell? Like I've never seen anyone talk about I, this. I was like, yeah, I never heard of it until you mentioned it to me, and then you forced me to watch it, and then I realized, oh, this is actually pretty good. <laughs> I like, yeah, this. I reckon all of you guys would like it quite a bit. Yeah. It's, it looked, a, it's yeah, a really, it looked... it's a straight up procedural like World War Two espionage drama. I suppose mm -hmm. it's pretty, pretty good, pretty good stuff. Um, a follow on Apple is asking us. Which fight would you put on top? Jackie Chan's Who Am I rooftop fight versus the Matrix Neo versus Smith subway fight. I think the subway fight. I think that's so fucking good. Like the the moves are probably not as technical, but like the the combination of like the pacing, the soundtrack that accompanies it, and just the I guess and where the, the characters are at at that point. Yeah, really yeah exactly. Uh, like it tells a story through the medium of fighting. Like there's a real back and forth flow to the fight that you can follow, and I think it's really fucking clever. Dude, the Matrix is so much better than two and three. <laughs> yes. Not even close. And that's not mentioned four. There, there is no four. Fuck that. There is no uh, two and three. There's only one Matrix film. I'll accept they exist and say they're bad. That's better than I can do. For hey, four. I would even say that the most underrated film answering the last question might be Matrix Resurrections. I'll go that far. Wow. Look at oh, that. it for the show tonight, everybody. <laughs> 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 now, Remo Williams, that's a good underrated movie. Uh, Dark City, they were mentioned. Dark City. Oh, Dark City. Yeah. That was Alex Proyas' follow Alex to Proyas. the that's, That wasn't yeah. underrated, though, was it? Because people know about that. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's like, it's like Dread. Well I guess you could say, like, in our sphere, Dread will not be underrated. Most people won't will not have heard of it, but it is yeah. a so I like, out of 10. I like how this guy tried to say the abyss, but he gave us the abbeys. The abbeys. <laughs> <laughs> think of the character from Last of Us. You know, there's a, a science fiction. Right? There's a science fiction film I always recommend to people called Aniara. It's a Swedish science fiction movie. Uh, I, I don't like anybody to like look into what it's about. Just say it's about a colony ship that's going from Earth to Mars. That's all you need to know about it and watch it and it it halfway through the movie i was just crawled up in a ball i was i was so it's just watch it what about Sweet dark star it's, it's streaming Robert. dark star that's that i love dark star i love dark star you know it's, that's a movie Weird. i've owned on every physical media it dark star was john carpenter's first feature it was made as a student film that a producer gave him money and he turned it into a theatrical feature hmm. and it's the only movie ever made that has a blow up beach ball as a, a as a as an alien that works yes <laughs> say no more uh, i'll do one more here um js pena says i know will smith sucks now but what are your thoughts on the men in black <laughs> men in black trilogy i got progressively less enthusiastic about them with each movie. i like the first one um, yeah i do yeah. too i remember yeah. loving the first one the second one was fun yeah. third one the main thing i had to say about it is just how impressed i was with josh brolin trying to do his uh <laughs> Conor Lee jones impression oh, yeah. that. that's another that comic really adaptation too and it's the, yes, the first it one especially is is really good alabu yeah uh, that's right we're getting loads of underrated well, movies here, by the way. and uh, to live and die in la by the way i'd have to throw that out there oh i agree william, with you there, william sir. freakins to live yes. in 1985 to live and die in la Oh, that had such a shocking ending. Oh, that was the, like first time you're like, what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, good soundtrack too. Wang Chung. Yep. Wang Chung. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I'll probably finish up there for this evening. Um, my panel. Thank you, gentlemen, for coming in for this. Uh, it's been awesome to talk Dune with you. It's been nice to talk about relatively good movies for a change and have a bit of positivity in the bar before we then talked about a load of crap stuff <laughs> you know it's nice to have a bit of variety in life but thank you for coming in and thank you for everyone who sent us all these excellent super chats we will of course always get through them on the catch-up stream um and thank you to my mods for doing the excellent work that they always do 
appreciate you guys very much, Lee. Um, is there anything you guys have got coming that you want to let us know about? Anything you want to pro promote? Anything like that? No, sir. All right. I, I've got a. Um, we're doing an. Um, I'm producing a audio drama, a podcast from Road to Perdition author Max Allen Collins, and we're doing. Uh, it's like a movie, but without pictures. Yeah. And it oh. stars. It stars. Um, uh, Todd Stashwick, who played yeah. Shaw in Picard season three. That's and cool. we have another, we have more actors. It's a SAG production. And uh, it's it's based on his 19 novel series about a corrupt Chicago PD officer who becomes a detective. And the first story, this is it's all of these stories are based on something that really happened. And in 19 in the early 30s, 1933, an assassin tried to kill American president FDR and instead accidentally killed the mayor of Chicago instead. <laughs> Oh, so the okay. the first story deals with it, it and and it's it's during the 1933 World's Fair, so it deals with that, and we're going to launch a crowdfunding campaign for that in about two weeks. Cool, so awesome, man. That. Yeah, I love audio dramas. Love yeah, you'll yeah. you'll be. I, I already did a, a proof of concept, so you can hear what we're going for. That's awesome, man. I hope it oh, I hope it finds a lot of success. I'll be sure to shout it out on Twitter. That's cool. Um, all right. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And that is all we got for today. So go away now. Bye.